Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the second day of the conference on genome editing for food safety and crop improvement organized by the Czech Academy of Sciences and EU SAGE as a part of the Czech EU presidency. I hope you had a great evening. And for those who were not here yesterday, I hope you had a pleasant journey here to Prague. My name is Eliška Zvolankva, for those who don't know me yet, and I am really honored to be this conference moderator. Yesterday we went through two sessions of speeches and we have two coming up, which also means that other distinguished speakers and guests have come. Welcome. And warm welcome also to those who are watching us online. And now it's time for me to invite on stage Professor David Honis, uh, the member of Academic Council of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and hello again. It's a long time since we met last at this stage. So welcome you back, and I'm really glad that so many of you found a way here back to the lecture hall, and I hope you enjoy the dinner yesterday and the social evening in Grabovka. And today I would like to welcome you again on the second and final day of the conference on genome editing for food safety and improvement that is still organized by the Czech Academy of Sciences together with EUSAGE. And uh, as I announced yesterday, I'm not going to take much of your time. I would just like to say that what I announced yesterday was that we have two sessions today. I believe a little bit more challenging, but still I hope and I'm pretty sure that those speeches will be very inspiring and great and we will have very good time. So the session three, will tell us something about the impact of gene editing on uh, the crop cultivation. And the second session will tell us something about the importance of social aspects and communication in accepting this uh, new technology. So thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the, all the communicating all these communication speeches. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Thank you. Let us start with the session number three, uh, which carries the name Potential Impact of Genome Edited Crop Cultivation and Use in Europe. As we mentioned multiple, time, multiple times yesterday, the current EU legislation put the NGTs under strong GMO regulations, unlike many other countries, for example, the USA, Japan, the South American countries, and so on and so on. Also, we heard that uh, how the discussion between scientists and policymakers continue. However, we also need uh, to involve the society, so that is what we are going to talk about now. And we will get to know some of the experience from countries that already went through the stage. As the first speaker, please welcome Kain Punhagen from the University of Beirut in Germany. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite and I uh, have to apologize up front for not being here since yesterday. I arrived tonight, but I heard it was an amazing event, both of which the social events and the uh, academic discussion. So this is and uh, this is always important. So I have no idea what has been discussed today, but what I'm going to present to you today are certain regulatory options. And what I'm, as a little disclosure, what I also have to tell you is that I'm part of the Gene Beacon project from Horizon Europe. So part of what I'm presenting over here is what we're being discussing inside of this uh, Horizon Europe project. Uh, and it's a work in progress. Uh, and we're going to see where, uh, what we'll actually, you know, we'll be presenting to the, co to the commission afterwards um, what kind of options we may have. Um, so, thank you so much uh, for the invite and without further ado, uh, many of you might ask yourself why we do have GMO regulations, why we do regulate um, uh, CRISPR-Cas in such a way at the European Union level. And I'm going to give to you a bit of a uh, short introduction to psychology and economics. And uh, if you look into how legislators think, and um, then you have to, you know, from their perspective, look into they want to be re-elected. And for that reason, we see a lot of you know, psychological shortcomings and biases that are present in the general population, population also in the lawmaking. So these kind of heuristics and biases indeed influence the process of creating an application of the law. So if you think law is always rational, or lawmakers always act rational, even if you convince them with more scientific evidence, more scientific, even more scientific evidence, you won't be hurt because that's usually not what they're interested in, at least not most of the time. 
So the agenda setting of a government, the problems definition, and political choices made to address these problems are greatly influenced by heuristics and biases, not so much by rational acting. And that has been long known already since the 2000s. And it helps to know these biases and, um, and, uh, and shortcuts the, that influence lawmaking. We're going to go through some of them that, um, that will guide the lawmaking that have been identified in terms of uh, GMO legislation particularly. So first of the status quo bias. So we know that preference for uh, people are always with what we're familiar with and that we believe we know better. We're familiar with non-GMOs. So we think other, uh, crops or foods from non-GMOs are better. As a, so we want to take, we're going to keep the status quo. And that is normal, that's also in your daily life. Um, these are the heuristics how most of the people actually work. Then we have the so-called natural's better heuristics. So we think that nature is benign, nature offers better solutions to, um, to, what we, uh, uh, to, our, solu to our problems. And therefore we always prefer natural over non-natural um, um, uh, solutions. So-called confirmation bias which means that uh, we build up at certain positions by considering information, that data, that confirms our previous knowledge. So we always seek in discussions for confirmation of what we already know, what we think, what we think is, is right. So uh, uh, if you, for example, want to convince someone with scientific knowledge, um, or if you want to convince a strong political party, it usually doesn't make sense to, um, to, to provide even more evidence because they all always only want to confirm their own uh, position. And the commitment bias, a tendency to remain committed to our past beliefs, that's what we always see. You know, GMO remains GMO, GMO needs to be regulated. And we've been fighting for this for all the time, so why should we relax now? And that is a strong commitment bias, which is engraved in, into, into our heuristics and biases settings. So-called loss aversion. So we describe the phenomenon that individuals dislike losses far more than they like corresponding, corresponding gains. So if we talk about benefits in, in regulation, those are gains, while usually the, the risks are losses. And people tend to focus much, much more on losses than on what they could potentially gain. And uh, this is also a long been proven fact. So if you argue with benefits, remind you that you have to overcome the loss aversion bias in the mind of, of people. We have the, the so-called availability heuristics. So they tend to focus on specific risks because they come more easily to mind, they know more better, they might be closer to one's, one's ideas, while other risks are out of sight. You know, why do we have GMO vaccinations? Well, because, you know, corona was just evident around the corner. And therefore, it's easier to, uh, to agree on this than if risks are further out of sight. Climate change, global warming, and uh, hunger. This is far, far away. So this is why people actually don't count it in into, into their respective mindset. Probability regrets. So individuals base the judgments on the intensity of possible harm rather than on the outcome that it may occur, um, that rather than the, uh, the probability that it may occur. If the outcome is pretty severe, you know, franken foods, uh, we're all going to, you know, become, um, um, we're all going to become um, um, major health threats, then the likelihood of the occurrence and people rather argue with the outcome and not with the probability, even if the probability is extremely low that some harm might occur. The regulation, if, there's, if the uh, outcome will be very severe, will be very strict. That we always see in legislation that this is responded to these kind of um, uh, biases. And last but not least, the so-called system of trade of neglect. So individuals tend to focus on a single problem rather than the full set that the regulation may trigger. So this one single problem that occurs, you know, in the, uh, that, that uh, one single harm in a certain occasion that might be um, more relevant to someone that people always focus on. They always focus on one argument, while the full set of arguments is usually not being, being uh, um, deployed. So there's a difference between science and populism, by the way. And so this is what we have to basically take into account when we argue for change in legislation. Those are the like, roadmaps that are in the minds of, of not only legislators, but everyday people. Um, and that is basically what we have to take into account. And that is why I might give you also an answer why you always ask, why, why do we have this kind of legislation? Why, why are people so resistant to all these arguments? No, here's the answer. Okay, after the short introduction on this, and I have very little amount of time, so this is why I have to speak a bit fast, I'm sorry for that.
Um, we we'll also look into the potential policy regulatory tools that are available to regulate. So overcoming these biases will be certainly not no regulation, and this is not, not going to fly for this reason. So we have to look into what kind of regulation we actually want. And the discussion at the moment goes very much into do we want improved procedure, do we you know, stay with what we have, or do we want something new, do we like little twisters, and by that we're already you know, in a confirmation bias, because we start from what we have, and then we move with little twists and shakes. But instead, look, I would I invite you to stay, take a step back if there was nothing. And now, what kind of options do we have for regulations? And those are the ones we have. Those are the different you know, boxes we can choose from. So we have approval, authorization, or registration procedures that we can choose from. And we'll go back into this a bit more detail in the following slides. We have liability possibilities. So the first distinction between before the product comes on the market or after the product comes on the market. Now those are the two basic distinctions. Approvals before, liability afterwards. Traceability reporting, for those of most of you that should be quite familiar. Labeling, uh, intellectual property policy, trade policy, and re research policy. Those are the major tools of regulation that we have if we would you know, start from a blank sheet. Now let's look first at the pre-market uh, regulation, because this is also what we have at the moment for most GMO regulations. And there's also a variety of possibilities how we can design such pre-market regulation. So first of all, of course, the most severe will be complete ban of all marketization for uh, NGTs. Uh, and well, factually, we have that for most of them already now. Um, not, in, not, uh, not practically, but factually, we have it. Um, the next option would be a partial ban only for certain products. So, for example, for organic products, that's also what we have at the moment. Um, the next possibility would be the marketization is subject to approval, authorization, or registration. And there we have different possibilities because there's different kinds of approval procedures, different kinds of authorization procedures or reg registration procedures. So we could, for example, having what we have now, the GMO regulation covering NGD, uh, and NGTs, so we do have a regular authorization procedure. Or we can make NGTs subject to specific approval procedures, which are specifically targeted only for these groups. Um, we could also do them, um, have, have them subject to registration only, not an approval procedure. What's the difference between registration and approval? Well, approval, you have to have a decision of the authority afterwards. While with the registration, you just submit some registration dossier and a data, and then you can put it on the market once you've checked all the boxes. So there's, no ch there's only a, a checkbox of whether everything is there on the list, and there's no actual approval procedure. We have that in uh, chemicals regulation in the European Union. Um, and the next possibility would be um, that NGT is subject to additional product requirements, such, for example, uh, nutritional composition or sustainability requirements that we will just you know, top, put on top of what we have already. We can also exempt them entirely from approval authorization requirements, or we will provide for an opt-out opt for member states' regulation, so it's a minimum harmonization approach that would also be possible, so that we have a different variety all over the European Union, each member state can do as they like, basically. That was what the Advocate General, by the way, in the court's judgment has, uh, has provided, uh, mostly overlooked, because that was the solution. It was not, the solution was not no regulation or no registration, the solution was regulation at member state level. And I don't think that the hard, lightly praised Advocate General's opinion was really what most of the people wanted, um, but that's a different story. Um, okay, let's... Um, look at the approval procedures themselves. So if we say, well, we want an approval procedure, what kind of options do we have there? Well, we can relax the data requirements for the NGTs and approval procedures. That's what we already see in different areas at the moment um, in, uh, in, in food law particularly, particularly with food innovations. We see this in novel food regulations, so the data requirements are severely um, 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 uh, relaxed uh, for certain kind of products. We can test and evaluate the NGTs in a controlled environment, so it's the sandboxing approach. Uh, so we'll have a different, uh, different type of regulation. Now I muted it, exactly, thank you. Um, so in a controlled environment, sandboxing approach, where specific regulations, relaxed regulations, are applying for a certain amount of time, so we can evaluate actually the risks or, uh, and the benefits. We can have participatory mechanisms in the procedures, so citizen stakeholder panels and so forth and so forth to increase the, uh, the legitimacy that would we have in uh, other approval procedures as well. Um, centralized procedures with decentralized elements, that's what we have at the moment. Uh, that's the comitology procedure basically, uh, with an opt-out option member states that can be top-down. Uh, 
We can have a complete decentralized procedure such as mutual recognition where, bas where basically the authorization is in the hand of one member state and then you can combine it with mutual recognition. So once it's approved in one member state, all other member states have to, um, have to go along. And we can also have the possibility of streamline and centralized procedures to put everything at the European Union level and streamline everything uh, in, in a monopoly of authorizations. Now, what do we have when we've been through the authorization procedure? There's also a difference. Also, there are several options that we have. We can have a generic authorization, which means once uh, uh, one company, for example, has gone through approval, it's valid for all, for all companies and throughout the whole union. That's what we have in the novel foods regulation at the moment. We can have license holder specific authorizations. So that means that only the one who actually you know, uh, uh, files for approval will also get the authorization for the product. We can have a market exclusivity for a number of years. That's mm, what, we, what we have uh, also in Novel Foods regulation. So that the one who files has five years of exclusivity and then it's going to go generically, generic. Um, why is that the case? Because of data protection usually, because you need to provide studies and the studies are costly and so that to, you know, to provide some incentive to return for the costs. Um, you can also introduce data exclusivity for a number of years. That means that the data you provided are exclusively yours and can be used in other, proce in other procedures. Or um, you can also apply for requirements for renewal or license modifications. Also, we have in most approved procedures after five years, you need to renew your authorization. So this is also what, you know, the different type of options that we have on the regulatory side. And um, if we look into post-marketing regulation, so there's after products on the market, and we shouldn't forget about this because th once the product is on the market, then we have surveillance uh, for mainly all kind of products. And uh, there we can uh, distinguish between traceability, labeling, and surveilling reporting requirements, um, which are all can be modified for the new genomic techniques. What is missing here is uh, liability. Why is liability missing? Because liability is a bit more complicated, and it's not. We can't simply put it in a box. Just think it, uh, think it with with you. And it's also not a competence for uh, the European Union. We do have liability regulations at the European Union level, but they're very, very minimal, and it's very much. Uh, a question of how much we can actually regulate liability at the European Union level. All right, so, uh, which comes at the moment, um, boils down to the fact that uh, the regulatory options that you may know from uh, Imagine Europa, um, which are, to my mind, a bit more, um, well, at the general level, not so much go into the respective details. And we'll, you know, we've been trying to combine the different, you know, aspects that, um, that are already presented. Um, which look like this at the moment. I'm not going to present this in more detail, um, but that's what we're working on at the moment. And uh, we're also looking into other possibilities um, which are on the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. There was a very swift and exhausting list of options. <laughs> Do you have any questions? It just Once more, I have to apologize for the, for the speed, but this was not possible otherwise. <laughs> okay, there is a question. I have question two, but... <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned the behavioral biases and aspects of, of uh, the regulation. Why, why is it different in EU and the United States or Japan or other countries, they already adopted the regulation? Yeah, well, why is, it diff why, is the, um, why is it different? Well, first and foremost, in the, um, the, the framing was different in both countries. So the bias is also triggered by certain framings. And another, you know, what I did mention, so-called um, categorization bias. So if you categorize new genomic techniques as GMOs right from the start, then you're biased towards arguing always from the GMO perspective. But if you if you categorize new genomic techniques in another way, like it was, for example, in the United States with novel foods, then you start arguing from the novel foods perspective. And that looks differently. And so it's a bit of a default situation you started to argue from. And if you start to argue always from the perspective of the GMOs, from transgenics, then of course your argument is different. And, um, and I think that was actually the case, for example, in the United States. Anybody? So there is the question from me. You talked about all these options and regulations and everything, and 
I think the basic question for now is how to overcome those biases to get into those re regulation possibilities, let's say. Well, we've all, okay. So we've already started a bit with. I mentioned framing already, and uh, we've already started with 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 doing exactly that. So uh, more purposeful information communication. Let's put it like this: uh, change the frames, um, look into how things are being framed, and uh, that is possibly the only option that we have. The problem is it's a long-term process, and it's very cumbersome, and it needs a lot of discipline. And um, But what we can already see is, if we looked at the recent Eurobarometer studies on the acceptance of uh, uh, new genomic techniques in the European Union, it's not such an issue anymore for citizens, seemingly. It's really not an issue anymore. People see, try to see more the benefits. And now it's, um, you know, it needs to travel into, into politics. And, um, and that, is, that is indeed the, the, the question. But as soon as politics realize that um, it's, um, they're not representing their voters anymore, um, then it's going to be a change. But before that, I, I really doubt it. Um, yeah, coming back to this, I mean, when, when I look at Brussels, I think um, we are always confronted with the most extreme um, positionings, so which probably do not reflect what actually is discussed in, 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 in the normal, let's say, communities or uh, between citizens. So um, how do you think we can make, let's say, the perception also on Brussels level a bit more realistic? Um, Do we have Chatham rules in here? Can I, can I just speak freely? <laughs> um, I think there's a certain generation who needs to die out in politics. Um, because if I look at the younger generation, it just looks very different to the older generation. And guys, you can't change the mind of the older guys. It's just not the way it works. They're just there and they're fighting for, they've been fighting since they were young and that's going to happen. Um, and that's sorry, but I think that's the that's the that's the major truth. Um, and um, we just need to wait or target particularly those people who are open at least for a discussion, um, and then try to find them to get a majority inside of the political party. It's a cumbersome process, but I've my experience is it's just don't waste your time on on on, on the old campaigners. Um, it's not worth it. Sorry to be blunt. <laughs> Guy, you had on your slide um, in, in, in the first ones, um, in terms of regulatory options, also the IPR uh, yeah. system. I have some difficulties in, in, in placing that in, in this story because that is about access to technology. Mm. Um, so, so I really see that a little bit as a separate issue from how you would like to regulate the marketing and, and uh, of... Oops. Gene edited organisms. Yeah, I can understand that someone has a, a problem with that and I can understand the argument. However, one would have to also take into account once one makes the argument that the product is dissimilar uh, from, from natural products, that has also a same um, argument can be made in IPR. So um, one has to, um, those are connected. If we make a substantial argument in one area, the same substantial argument can be made in another area. And that has different effects in both areas. So looking not at IPR policy, I think would, make, would miss out on a huge picture uh, looking into you know, what we need to look at when we look at how we argue, argue in one area and then how that would work uh, then out in another area. So this is why IPR is on there. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Bonhagen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please welcome on stage a member of the European Parliament from Italy, Mr. Herbert Dorfmann. Good morning. Thank you very much for giving me um, this opportunity to uh, reflect together with you uh, the position of the European Parliament, or at least of my political group, about NGTs. Well, um, I'm one of these lawmakers, as you said, Professor Brunhagen, squeezed between uh, academic evidence and the wish or the need to be re-elected. And uh, I did not um, agree that much on, on, on the age because 
first of all, I, I don't know exactly if I'm young or, or, or the ones who need to die out. But actually, looking what's happening in the parliament, the party which is most strongly against uh, NGTs have, have, has the youngest members. And the parties which are most in favor has the oldest members. So it's not that much a question of age. Age, age I think, is more a question of, let's say, political, political uh, uh, statement or political conviction. Well, I personally think we are in a very particular moment <clears throat> for different reasons. We are coming out or we are leaving behind a production year in agriculture which has been extremely difficult uh, all over Europe or in most parts of Europe, uh, a lot of droughts all over Europe. We saw may this year maybe better than in the years before that climate change is a reality now, also in agricultural production. We have on the other side a situation in Ukraine which clearly influences food supply in Europe and in the world. And I'm dealing with agricultural policy uh, since some years, uh, but uh, food security, at least in Europe, was not part of the political debate, never. We spoke also in, in, in the last years, speaking about the reform of the common agricultural policy, we spoke about everything but not about food security in Europe. Now food security is back on stage, so people understood and also politicians understood that food security in Europe is not forgiven, we need to have a look at it. And, um, and we have on the table um, from the Commission side, from the European Commission side, the European Green Deal, um, very concretely a proposal from the Commission side on the sustainable use of pesticides, and at least uh, my political group thinks that uh, things need to go hand in hand. So if we oblige farmers to reduce the, the use of pesticides, we need to give them uh, alternatives to the use of pesticides. We cannot simply reduce or oblige to reduce. We need to find, we need to give solutions. And uh, in this context, I think there is on one side an opinion which says NGTs, new genomic techniques, can solve our problems. This, honestly, I don't think. But I think that NGTs can be part of the solution, can give a real uh, solution uh, or a real contribution, finding more resistant plants, plants which could resist to the problems arising from, on one side from, from, from climate change and the other side on, on uh, giving the opportunity to use less uh, uh, pesticides in, in Europe. And this is a bit, let's say, the scenario in which we are, we are acting, we are acting in, in this moment. Well, uh, you know we have this uh, uh, court uh, judgment from 2018, it's already four years old now. Uh, this judgment has been politically heavily in the politics heavily criticized. I personally never did this. I think the judges in Luxembourg did what they needed to do. If, if you look at, at our legislation, um, our legislation is uh, dated in 2001, the Directive uh, 18 from 2001 uh, is coming from a period when CRISPR-Cas didn't, simply didn't exist and new genomic techniques didn't exist. And therefore, uh, if you look, um, I, I, at least I think, if you look at the directive as it is today, uh, the judgment is okay. And if you look at the judgment, the, the judges did not say that um, there is no way out from this situation. They simply said, if you look at, you look at the directive 18 from 2001, you need to consider these, te these technologies as GMOs. And policymakers, if you don't, if you want to have it differently, you need to act. This is more or less the, let's say, the squeezing the, 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 the judgment from 2008, what, what the, the, the court said. And I think this is not an obligation, but it's an invitation 
from from the from the court side to act and to uh, realize that uh, 20 years, 20 years or 21 years after 2001, there is an, an, a need to adapt the directive. And this is politically, and here I fully agree with Professor Brunhang, this is politically not that easy because everybody in politics who is in favor and who is against knows how sensitive this matter in Europe, in the European Union and in Europe and in European societies is. And therefore, uh, for now, fundamentally not a lot of things happened. Well, the European Commission acknowledged in several moments that uh, um, it is in favor of, uh, of uh, a new regulation. Uh, first in the farm to fork uh, strategy and then in the famous stu uh, study in 2021 where the commission stated clearly that uh, NGDs can be a co give a contribution to a more sustainable food uh, system. Uh, I was myself a rapporteur on the parliament's position on the, on the, on the farm to fork strategy. I mentioned NGDs in, this, in my report um, uh, welcoming uh, new legislation or underlining the necessity for new regulation on NGTs, and this wording had the majority. And this brings me to the idea or the conviction that in this moment, in this European Parliament, there is a majority in favor of a new uh, ruling or new uh, legislation on, um, on GMOs and on NGTs. Clearly, we didn't go into all the aspects rightly Professor Bornhang pointed out, but because then you need to see what, what is really the content of this new, new legislation, what is, what is about labeling, how, what is about the authorization. But, but I think fundamentally there is today a clear majority in the House to say, uh, which acknowledges that there is a need to act and that NGDs can give uh, are, or are an opportunity to go to go in the in the right direction. So, what to do? Um, first of all, you know, and this I don't do, I don't want to repeat this because it has been said already yesterday. Um, there is uh, not only a study from the Commission side. There is also and the result of a public consultation. And surprisingly, for me surprisingly, the uh, public consultation says a bit the same, the same thing. The, the public consultation has, uh, or the, the outcome of the public consultation brings to a large uh, majority in favor of NGTs. I personally didn't expect this, honestly. I personally thought that this, uh, um, uh, with this, this uh, um, uh, public consultation will be hijacked by who is against uh, the, the NGTs, but this was not the case. And if you look at the, at the outcome, we are more or less two thirds, three, four, three out of four uh, who are in favor uh, to act. What are the problems? I, I think the problems are fundamentally two. The Commission said also yesterday, or the representative of the Commission said that uh, it is planned for now to come up with a proposal by the end of next year. So more or less in one year's time. This is uh, a bad idea. A very bad idea. Because this means that this Parliament, this elected Parliament, will not have the chance to vote on this proposal because this parliament will be renewed in May 2024. And even with a big, let's say, uh, majority, or even uh, you need to be aware that there, is a, there, are, there are technical times in the European Parliament. Um, proposal which comes by the end of next year, considering that the last plenary meeting of this parliament will be in April 2024, there is no technical time. And I personally think it is not the best idea to deal with this topic under election. Because there you come exactly at the point which Professor Bodenhagen pointed out before. Under elections, politicians, as me, think more to be re-elected than in normal times. So this problem becomes even more concrete. 
And therefore, I think, uh, or we are pushing, at least my political group, and we will meet uh, Commissioner Kiakidis also next week, we are pushing um, the Commissioner to speed up, to, uh, to uh, bring this proposal to the Parliament before I, I personally think it should be it should go in parallel with the sustainable use of pesticide directive so the 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 idea or the position of my political group is to say we will not vote in favor of the sustainable use of pesticide directive if we do not have the other one so we want to see it in parallel um because otherwise is is it would i personally think it would be wiser to bring it after the next elections in order not to kill it, to be politically very open. And the second uh, idea from my side, and this is very much connected with com communication, which we will discuss further later, or later on in this morning. I'm, I have to tell you, many years ago, I was a student at the university, and uh, in, uh, I worked on GMOs in the late 80s. And uh, the storytelling about GMOs was exactly the same as it is now about NGTs. Exactly the same. We told each other that GMOs may bring to more resistant plants, to plants which can grow in Africa because they need less water and so on and so forth. If I look today at the list of GMOs allowed to be imported into the European Union, and we have a lot, as you know. We allow the, only, the cultivation of only two plants, but we have a lot of them we import into the European Union. Most of them, 80%, more than 80%, is nothing else than an integration within the same company of the seed and the plant protection product. On this, we need to be clear. And why this happened, I think, at least I think why this happened. I think this happened especially in Europe because with our legislation and with our mood towards GMOs, public research went out from the game. We left this in the hand of the seed producers. And the seed producers are very often, at least the big ones, are the same one than the producer of the plant protection products. And I do not want to criticize them. For me, it's, it's completely clear. The company which produces both has the interest to connect both. We should not make this mistake again. Because part of the problem with GMOs, part of the problem of the public with GMOs, is this fact. And therefore, I need to coming back to NGTs, I'm aware that the production or the, the breeding with NGTs is much easier than classical GMOs. So a lot of smaller companies can come in, which will not see necessarily the, the connection with their own plant protection products because they do not have both. So it's not only the big, big, big players in the world. But we need on board the public research because the public research has a bit of different point of view. And the public research can stay on board only if they know that the result of this research can be used in Europe. Because who, who uses public money cannot spend money without knowing that the result of what it's doing will have a, a, a possible out, or a positive outcome for the society, for who is paying taxes. And therefore, I think it's need, it's, we have a need to act. Because if we do not act now, if we leave this in the situation where we are now, we will see more and more that the public research needs to go out on the public research remains in other parts of the world, but not in the European Union. This remains will again go in the hand of the big players as I said, I have nothing against them. And we end a bit in the same situation as we are in GMOs. And this, I think, is the real danger. Therefore, I'm very much in favor on supporting and also pushing, and together with my colleagues, 
uh, who are here uh, this morning, we are really pushing uh, to have this legislation as soon as possible and give certainty to who is acting in this field and give certainty at the end of also to the consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your words. Are there any questions to Mr. Dorfman? Yeah. Um, maybe more a comment. So uh, thank you very much for your um, presentation. And I fully support specifically your last statement on the diversity of uh, players in this field. So also smaller companies to be able to be uh, involved in this and to, to provide products to the market. Um, this, of course, requires this urgency, which you just uh, uh, mentioned, but it also requires an ambitious um, new regulation. So not staying within the current system, but really um, having something different, which really allows also the diversity of, of players in the market, including, of course, public science to, 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 to have a chance here. As long as it stays in GMO framework, even if it's GMO light, um, those smaller players will not have a chance. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, coming from a public institution, of course, like uh, hearing more public research funding for us. But um, besides that, um, the claim of diversity I would like to also endorse. Um, one of the issues that might be taken into account or two is that the costs for approval are just extremely high and therefore it's only affordable for the bigger ones to do it. And uh, so that might be one of the reasons, not only the type of research, but also simply the costs of going through approval. And the second, what might be taken into account is that even if a smaller company goes through approval, even if it's on the market and has an innovative product, once it's successful, what we see it's bought up by the big ones. And um, so remaining on the market, even if one was through, is really difficult. So just for just a bit of a, an idea of you know, where one might tighten the screws a bit. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Dorfman. It was, um, I think, a very important um, uh, presentation that you made. I, can, I think there are um, uh, two uh, uh, really critical points. I think the timing is a really important one, and the faster we can get um, a new uh, legislation uh, through the European Parliament, uh, maybe pre preferable in Q2 already next year. I think the higher the chance will be that it passes on this legislation of the, the Parliament. But I was um, just also wondering, um, uh, and that's my, my question to you, like whether, uh, like for academic uh, uh, research, which we, which we think we all need actually, we really need to be able to, to bring uh, products uh, to the field and uh, to test on them whether they they really work because in a lab well, you only have a, a proxy look of uh, what can be done. So my, my question is whether it would be possible to have a, a two-step procedure where it would be a fast, um, let's say, making the legislation to do field trials much more easier. I mean, the UK actually went that path actually in a, in a couple of months. Now it's quite a hell to do, a f we do field trials with genome editing crops and you have to have a whole the dossiers, you have to emasculate corn, and like every, every week there's somebody coming to control. I mean, it's, it's a hell, you have to fence this thing. So but this may be a way out that we can maybe or at least stimulate uh, and go faster towards actually implementing or testing this technology also for a European uh, agriculture, not losing the momentum what we see uh, somewhere else in the world. Well, honestly, I have to tell you, my experience uh, in science ended in laboratories at, of the university, so I do not, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an expert about CRISPR-Casp. But I personally think uh, in the legislation we should look more than at the technology, we should look at the result. Um, and this means um, we should say there are technologies which um, are precise, but they bring to a result which in theory could happen also in nature. Like, for example, all the mutagenesis which are, is used largely in breeding today. Nobody speaks about it. If, if, we, if in a normal, normal breeding process there is uh, the use of um, techniques uh, which um, bring to, 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 uh, 
to mutagenesis, uh, like, uh, uh, like nuclear uh, ionization and so on and so forth. Nobody speaks about this because fundamentally it's only a technology which accelerates something which could, could occur also in, 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 on, in nature. And I'm well aware that part of this technology can bring also to results which in nature are not possible. So I think th that is more the, the question, the legal question. And starting from this, we should simply say if, if something, if you use a technology which brings the result, which could occur also in nature, why is this within all the GMO thinking? We should bring it out. Also, if it comes to labeling, because I'm very much convinced, and this is also the, the position of my political group, if we start to say you need to label this, first of all, we all know that this is not that easy, because compared with GMOs, it's impossible to find out, starting from the seed or, or starting from the product, if this is a result of, of an NGT. It's simply impossible. So if I get grain from, from the US, uh, if, if, if it's, uh, if it's uh, produced with uh, classical GMO, I can find out immediately. But on NGTs, I cannot find out. So labeling is not that easy. And if we start with labeling, we create additional costs in the whole production chain, which could be higher than the benefit we get. So we destroy the thing from the very beginning, I think. Um, and, and therefore, I think we should abandon this idea of, of labeling and we should really say okay if, if we have plants which are breeded with this and they, they, they respect certain criteria we should bring them out from the GMO thing. Thank you. I'm really sorry I saw your hand but we don't have time so maybe you can discuss it further during the coffee break right? Thank you. Thank you Mr. Dorfman. The third speaker had a probably a long journey to hear from the USA. Please welcome Gregory Jaffe, the Senior Director at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Uh, good morning, all, and I'm welcome to be, uh, I really thank everyone for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about securing societal benefits for ge genome editing. Um, I think I'm going to take a little different tact than some of the other speakers today. I probably will say a couple of things that some of you may think is a little more controversial, um, but I'd love to have a discussion about that either afterwards or throughout the rest of the day. Uh, but I'll also say some things that uh, I agree with some of the other speakers about. So I'm going to quickly give you a little bit of background on the organization and the, where, the, where I come from. Um, but I'm probably going to talk broadly about the role of successful commercialization, the road to successful commercialization of genome edited products and what I think that needs to be. And regulation's part of that, but it is not the whole answer. I think if we solve the regulatory answer tomorrow, that doesn't mean we would have genome edited products on the market being accepted by consumers and, and, grow, and grown and sold. So I think there's more to it than regulation. Everybody talks about regulation, everybody suggests that's the major roadblock, but I think we have to think more holistically about how these products come to market. So I represent the Center for Science and the Public Interest. We're a nonprofit NGO located in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do food and nutrition. We've been around for 51 years. We try to advocate and educate based on the best available science out there. I've put up our mission statement. I won't go through it, but we talk about equitable food systems, preventing disease, transparency, independent science. In our mind, science uh, is really what drives our advocacy and our education activities. We publish a Nutrition Action Health newsletter that comes out 10 times a year. I mention this not so you become a member uh, or get our newsletter, but because of our conflict of interest policy. So where do we get our funding? 100% of our funding either comes from our member subscribers, who are individuals like yourselves who buy this newsletter for $20 a year, who give us individual donations. Some of them give us $10, some of them give us $1,000. And we get funding from philanthropic foundations like the Gates Foundation, for example, or the Rockefeller Foundation. We take no funding from industry, and we never have in the existence of our organization. We do that because we advocate and we criticize industry at times, and we don't want anyone to think that we aren't doing anything other than based on the best available science. And we also take no government grants. 
because we go in and lobby the government. And we also don't want people to think that our funding might in some way bias the positions that we take. Um, our, I run the biotechnology project, and we've said loudly to consumers in the United States that there are no health risks from the current crops that are grown in the United States. We said that those crops provide benefits to farmers and the environment. We think that's the evidence that's out there. We do think they should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, and we do believe in the need for biosafety regulatory systems. Um, we also want sustainable agricultural practices, and we believe that GE crops can play a role in that. They're not necessarily playing that role in the United States today, but they can play a role in that. Um, I'm also here representing the Alliance for Science. This is an advocacy and communications organization uh, funded by the Gates Foundation, located at the Boyce Thompson Institute in Ithaca, New York, related to Cornell University. Um, and that works in developing countries in Africa and uh, in Southeast Asia to try to, uh, again, bring scientists to the debate around using innovative agricultural technologies to help small-scale farmers. So I sort of bring in several hats as I come here today. So what does the road to co commercial acceptance of genome-edited crops look like? I want to present a picture of what I think that is. And that picture actually is not just mine, but uh, my, my NGO and five other mainstream NGOs in the United States got together and wrote this article, Responsible Governance of Gene Editing and Agriculture and the Environment, published this in Nature Biotechnology last year. Um, and these are groups like the Wild World Wildlife Federation, the Nature Conservancy, food and environmental organizations. And we sort of said, all these organizations said, we all believe that genome edited crops can play a role, that we all think that they can be safe and they can play a role in achieving each of our different organizations' mandates, whether mine is better food safety, better nutritious food, whether it's the Nature Conservancy's conservation, whether it's environmental impacts, whatever that is. But we said, but what is that road to getting social license? What is that road to achieving societal buy-in for these products? And really, we came up with six principles, and like like to talk about several of those principles today. And these principles are not hierarchical. hierarchical. Um, they all are equal in our mind. One of those is transparency. Uh, and these aren't, I don't think this is rocket science. You know, we're not the first ones to say some of these principles or the last ones. Uh, one is transparency, two is inclusive access to the technology. We heard a little bit about that earlier with the IPR issues. Uh, inclusive societal engagement, effective science-based regulation, voluntary practices, voluntary stewardship, um, and societal benefits. And our view is if we can move to achieve these principles, that will give us social license to have these products accepted in society. So I'd like to talk about a few of those. I don't have time to talk about all of them. But the first one I want to talk about is potential societal benefits. And I think this comes very good uh, right after Herbert's uh, discussion. Because you know, what are the products that are going to come out, I think, is important from a consumer <laughs> perspective, how this technology will be perceived. I think somebody mentioned the Calex high oleic soybean oil yesterday as one of the first two products that's out there. It is out there, although I'm not sure for how much longer that company is having serious financial problems, and they may not be a going concern as of 2023. Um, citrus greening is a very big problem in my country. Everybody likes their fresh orange juice in the morning from Florida, but that may not exist without some solution. Could be gene editing. Uh, Reduced gl gluten uh, wheat would have major benefits to some po populations who have gluten intolerance. Um, and uh, we all like our chocolate every once in a while. Uh, making sure that t t cocoa, cacao survives would be important things. So, you know, I think there's disease mitigation, land enhanced yield, abiotic stresses uh, for climate, nutritional improvements. I think it is important that the products that come out have societal benefits. I think I agree with Herbert. If, you know, if gene editing is used just to have more herbicide tolerance associated with pesticides, and don't get me wrong, I think there's important reasons to reduce herbicide's impact in this world and stuff like that, but that's not exactly the societal benefits that are really going to get consumers excited about this technology. Um, Effective science-based regulation, we've talked a lot about that, and I know one of the reasons I was invited here was to talk about the U.S. regulatory system, so I will talk about that for a couple of minutes. Um, but any time you look at regulation, you've got to really do a balancing. How do we balance ensuring safety and consumer confidence with technological innovation and product adoption? And, you know, I think the discussion here in Europe has been maybe the scale is tilted one 
way too much than the other way. Um, different countries are going to tilt that scale a different way. The question is, you know, some people would argue the U.S. it's tilted too much towards innovation, not enough towards safety. Other uh, NGOs, not mine necessarily. But how do you get that right? How do you figure out how to balance that? And you have to balance that um, for lots of reasons. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the U.S. regulation of gene-edited products. I think it's very misunderstood. And so I want to tell you that. And my bottom line is the U.S. regulations treat GMOs and gene editing the same. And so I'm going to say that again. The U.S. regulations treat GMOs and gene editing the same. People think they treat them differently. They do not treat them differently. They treat them the same. I think they're the only country. Many of these countries you see on all those charts yesterday with the greens and things like that treat them differently. Here we are actually treating them the same. And let me explain that. So there was a new rule established in 2021. Uh, this was the new secure rule for biosafety oversight at USDA. And you know, I agree with the, with the last speaker, you know, it's 20 years, it's time to relook at your directive. Well, in the United States, the, the rules of, for regulating GMOs at USDA were like 25 years old. So it was time to revise those. We had learned a lot. We learned about what the real risks were how to improve on it. So anyway, this is the new rule, but I put up there the definition of genetic engineering, techniques that use recombinant, synthesized, or amplified nucleic acids to modify or create a genome. That is the definition, the only definition in the United States for genetic engineering. There is no way that you can say that gene editing is not genetic engineering according to this definition. It just is. And so we don't have that distinction in the United States. We don't make that distinction, and I know that's not necessarily what the industry wanted when the rule was proposed, um, and it may not be the precedent that other people in the world want, but that is what we have in the United States. So gen gene editing is a subset. If we had a Venn diagram, gene editing is the subset of genetic engineering. It is not, you know, there aren't two circles that have different parts that overlap and don't overlap. Gene editing is enclosed, encompassed around genetic engineering. So, so, one, the definition is included in genetic engineering. Two, the U.S. has no concept of foreign DNA. Everybody else talks about, is there foreign DNA or is there not foreign DNA? That does not come into consideration in deciding the regulatory status of a, of a genetically engineered product, a crop in the United States. You have, we, have, we have products that have foreign DNA in them that are exempt from regulation. And we have products without foreign DNA in them that are exempt from regulation. Foreign DNA is not a concept. And, you know, the scientist in me believes that there's nothing inherently risky about foreign DNA. You know, there's, I mean, every GMO in the United States that's had foreign DNA entered has been proved, has been found safe, and had, has had benefits associated with it. So, you know, and I understand here in Europe, we have to bring politics in, and that causes changes. But we should also make those kinds of distinctions. I don't think there's a scientific basis for saying that foreign DNA is inherently risky or needs to be regulated. Certain applications of it, certain things, but, but not necessarily itself. That may not be a scientific trigger. It may be a political trigger, but let's be real, it's not a scientific trigger. Um, and the regulatory system in the United States for, for USDA is not is interested, and this is the key, on in adverse impacts on agriculture. The issue is whether something's a potential plant pest or a noxic, noxic weed. So we are not looking at all environmental risks. USDA is only looking at whether something is a potential plant pest or a noxic weed. And in that case, you know, that may be an easier question to answer than the questions that are being asked in other regulatory systems. This is not, it, it, this is not exclusively looking at everything in the environment, impacts on non-targets or all kinds of other things. It's really looking at whether something's a plant pest or not. So this is the regulatory system in the U.S. that I put a chart together for. It is amazingly complex. It would take me about 45 minutes to explain that, and I have a good YouTube presentation I made on it. If you want, I'll give you that reference to it. Um, I can't go here and explain it all to you, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about it at lunch. Um, but the reality is, is there's all kinds of different pathways, and there's, in the end, some things are regulated and some are not regulated. And so some gene-edited products are exempt for regulation, but some GMOs are also exempt from regulation. In fact, most things that use agrobacterium and introduce a, far, a foreign DNA are exempt from regulation unless that particular foreign DNA has a plant pest characteristic associated with it. So the vast majority of, of 
arrows come to the non-regulated. There are a few things that do get regulated and have a risk assessment associated with it. But as I said, they treat GMOs and gene editing the same. The most controversial part of this regulation was the self-determination. So you all talk about some sort of you know, notification or something like that. That is not required in the United States. So, so companies can uh, take a GMO or a gene-edited product that uh, doesn't fall within the regulation, self-determine that they don't, aren't regulated, that they don't they meet an exemption, and they don't need to tell anybody. And that's problematic in my mind and for others, and I'll get to that with some of my other things. But, but that is, I think, probably one of the most controversial aspects of this was not that the fact that some things get exempt and some GMOs get exempt and some gene-edited things get exempt, but the most controversial aspect was whether who makes that decision. Does, it have to be, does the regulator have to uh, look at that and, and, uh, and sort of say, that's fine, you've done it correctly, which happens in many other countries and you'll hear about in, in, in Argentina in a minute, or can the companies just self-determine that and, and not tell anybody? necessarily not provide that information. Um, I'll just give one, we have several agencies that regulate biotech, so just to prove my point that GMOs and gene editing are tr treated the same, for biotech crops under FDA, they have a voluntary consultation process. That's been what's been in existence for 30 years. It's not mandatory, although most companies do it. That same process exists for gene edited products, and in fact, the Calex High Lake Oil went through the same biotech consultation that BT corn or BT maize went into. So there's no distinction there. Similarly, I know this is a conference on crops, not animals, but FDA has a mandatory pre-market approval process for intentional genomic alterations, and that is any alteration of the genome that's done. Uh, and so that also treats GMOs and gene-edited products the exact same. Uh, they do have the ability to streamline things, and so we did see for the first gene-edited animal that they looked at, they did provide a streamline process. They can do that in their discretion, and they did do that in their discretion, and I would expect they would do that again for things where you're just duplicating an already existing allele in another uh, individual in that same organism, uh, and that's what they did. So, but again, um, it, they are treating them the same, you know, they, in terms of that. We most recently had an executive order. You may have heard about this last month. I'm not going to spend time on it, but, you know, Bio, be a bioeconomy is a priority of President Biden, improving biomanufacturing. Most of this was more drugs and chemical related, but there are aspects of it that are about agriculture. I wrote a blog about it. I'm happy to send that blog to anybody. But I think it does you know, raise the profile of the U.S. wanting to really be, continue to be a leader in these fields. And there are discussions there in regulatory reform. I have to say they're not much different than the same paragraphs that were in the Trump administrative order on this. Um, and those haven't really been implemented, so we'll see what happens on that frame. Um, but, you know, the reality is, so where, where, where should regulation go in different countries? You know, not all gene editing is the same. You can add a few nucleotides, you can delete a few nucleotides, you can add one or more genes. Um, they're both minor and major changes. Um, I do think that some countries, you know, when they start exempting things like deletions and things, there are some problematic aspects of that, and that's why I really advocate for more of a crop trait uh, kind of situation system where you look at the crop and the trait and you exempt things based on risk. Um, and the examples I'll give here is three different, you know, deletion products. So the first one here is Calex, you know, deleted, uh, um, inactivated a single gene and you have a cold storage potato. That to me seems like something could be done in uh, natural breeding. And so Little or no regulation would probably be appropriate for that. I don't think there's much risk that we can come perceive about that type of thing. Uh, now, there's a company here. I think this company was, or um, Arandex, I'm not sure where they're from. They want to produce a hypoallergenic -aller peanut. They're going to switch off three genes, and they think this peanut will now be safe for people who have peanut allergies. Um, in many countries, that would not require regulation because it's just doing deletions. I'm a consumer advocate. I'm a group with food and nutrition, food safety people. I'm really concerned that they might market a hyperallergenic peanut and nobody in the government's gonna check to make sure that that really is hyperallergenic. People could go to the hospital, people could die from that allergy. And so, you know, to me, that's that the kind of trait they have requires that to have some level of oversight. Um, so you can't just look at it. Similarly, the third one, uh, a Spanish organization, 
uh, deleting 35 out of 45 genes to make a gluten reduced gluten wheat. Again, how re reduced is that gluten? How, what is the impact on populations who have gluten sensitivity? Um, you know, I don't know if that should just be done and trusting the industry to make those determinations and make proper, uh, you know, uh, disclosures about those things. And again, we're, we're playing with potential people's lives and there is liability, but that's after the fact. Um, so, so I raise these as examples to show that if you just make, you know, blanket, all of these theoretically could be done in nature because we're just dealing, you know, silencing genes that may not capture what we really want to capture in terms of things to both regulate and not regulate. So I think you want science-based, proportionate, transparent, and efficient. I think the trigger should be the crop and the trait, not the process by which it was made. But the issue is the potential risk of that crop trait combination, not whether it's similar to something we previously did. Um, you know, just because we did something previously, it could have been fairly risky. You know, you build a new house today, you, you, uh, you have to do the new building code. Uh, you, we don't take old houses and make them get up to the new building code, but the new building code is more restrictive than the old building code. You know, we don't, we, as we get better, as we learn more, um, we may get tighter in what we think are potential risks and so forth. So I don't think the fact that we didn't regulate something in the past is a reason not to regulate something now that might be risky, but if it's not risky, we clearly shouldn't regulate it. Um, so what are some of those other principles? I think voluntary stewardship. I think the reality is that many of these products aren't going to be regulated and probably correctly so. So what takes the place of that? Consumers are still gonna wanna know that, there have been, that safety has been satisfied and that, and that, and so pro voluntary stewardship may be a way to do that. In the United States, we have several different organizations, many of them industry related, who are putting together uh, uh, ways of having stewardship programs. Here's the Center for F uh, Food Integrity's responsible use of gene editing and agriculture framework. Um, you know, this is a responsible use guidelines that gives social license and consumer trust. I was one of the many stakeholders who helped develop this. It goes into six areas, transparency, stakeholder engagement, safety, um, verification, but it is a voluntary system that uh, food, food retailers and others say that if you do these things, we think will help get consumer trust and get social license out there. You can see companies that have already signed up and endorsed it, um, and the idea is that this would help for uh, getting that social license, in, especially in situations where there is no regulation. Uh, here's the American Seed Trade Association. They've done best practices for gene editing, a gu an evaluation guide for genome edited plants. Again, this is all voluntary stewardship, but I think these are gonna play more and more important roles, especially uh, in a deregulatory environment as part of that social license. Transparency, I think, is critical. Um, you know, we live in a world of a lot of transparency. Everybody's on their phone. Everybody can get information all the time. Everybody can get bad information all the time. Um, you know, how do we get out there information? If things are hidden from consumers, you know, many consumers will not look at available information, but it's important to them that it's available out there. Consumers who are interested will want to know, that's a small segment, and that they should have the ability to get that information. Uh, but if you can't, but if somebody can't get the information, they wonder why it's being hidden from them. And that's when bells ring off. So people think the information's there, when they go, look, it's not there, then they're like, why is it hidden? And then automatically people get to that worry. They're hiding it from me because it's dangerous, because there's a problem out there. And if you provide the information after the fact, it looks like you, you were covering up something. So, you know, I think it's more important to be at the front end and really work to get the information out. And to be honest with you, if we have societal benefit products, we're gonna wanna get that information out. Con companies are gonna wanna provide information about their products, the benefits, how did they achieve those? You know, anybody who gene, does gene editing is wanna get a premium from the farmer for that. They're gonna wanna tell them, you know, we did this, we use these great new techniques to get this great trait that's really gonna help you improve your yield. Um, and, you know, so I think they're going to be good stories to tell. So I don't think transparency is going to be a major problem here. Um, I don't, when I talk about transparency, I do not mean in any sense on package labeling. So I just want to make that clear. I think there are lots of ways to have transparency other than tra on fact package labeling. And I think transparency is really essential for trade, for markets, for coexistence. A product which negatively affects other products 
such as organic or whatever, will attract opposition. And you don't want uh, to have a, this a fight between gene editing and organic because the organic market is established. And if, they're, if, if that's the choice that you tell retailers, they're going to pick organic. They're not going to pick gene editing. So you want to figure out ways to coexist and get along. And the reality is, you know, organic movement has already said these aren't compatible with organic. And we can disagree with that. We can decide that's not necessarily the maybe the right, right scientific or other decision, but that's the reality out there. The non-GMO project has said these are just as risky. I, I don't agree with their science or anything, but that's a reality. So there already are distinctions in the marketplace. So how do gene edited products get into that marketplace and coexist? I'm looking at practicality solutions. So I've advocated the United States for a national registry of gene edited agricultural products. I will admit this is controversial. But I believe that takes away, the, that, that brings the transparency. If a consumer wants to look and see if there's a gene-edited mushroom on the market, they can look to the registry. If a retailer wants to be able to explain to their consumer whether they have a gene-edited mushroom that they're selling, um, they can do that. If somebody wants to start having a trade discussion about whether there's gene-edited soybeans and whether those can trade to Europe and what, whether they meet regulatory issues or trade issues, they can do that. If you don't have that information, how do you have those conversations? And I can tell you that a retailer does not want to be put in the position where somebody comes up to them and says, because the retailer has their brand, they have their reputation, and they, somebody comes up, you know, I'm a, I'm a consumer. Hey, can you tell me, are you selling gene-edited tomatoes here? And if the tes Tesla, Tesco says, I don't know, how is the consumer going to react to that? Okay? So if Tesco can't answer that question for them, it gives them some, well, it's not really important. You don't need to know that. Um, the consumer is really going to be taken aback by that, and they're going to lose that consumer. So if you put Tesco in that position, they're just going to say, I'm not going to, the only way, if you can't give me the information or I can't find the information, then I'm just going to say to my supply chain, I don't want any gene-edited tomatoes because I don't want to have to, I don't want to be able to answer that question with 100% certainty. So I've called for this, you know, it hasn't come to be. I think this is a first step and a way forward that gives some of that transparency. Finally, societal engagement, um, allow different stakeholders to have conversations, figure out how to address these market issues, these coexistence issues, uh, determine how to get those societal benefits, those win-win, and to start early in development. If you start early in development and you get other stakeholders on board and they see the benefit, you already have them as you move through that process. So in conclusion, you know, I think gene editing has potential to positively provide societal benefits. Um, Commercial products need more than good science and regulatory approval or exemption. Uh, that social license is essential, and I think there are some aspects I talked about that. Um, and a product with consumer benefits, if it's tastier or cheaper or whatever, I think consumers will become interested and their GM, GE concerns will vanish. I think, you know, in the end, that's what uh, revolves, consumers care the most about. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Jeffy, for zooming in us, for us, the USA system. I'm afraid we don't have time for any questions left. So please feel free to get in touch with Mr. Jeffy at the coffee break or during the lunch. Thank you very much. Quite a journey brought here to Prague also the next speaker. Martin Lima from the GMS National University in Argentina will share some experience from Argentina with the GMO and GE. Okay, hello everyone. Um, special thanks to the organizers and the Czech Academy of Sciences for the opportunity of being here. It's a pleasure knowing this city for the first time and also it's an honor to be able to contribute or help with this policy making uh, uh, debate that you are having. Let me start by, oh, sorry. Let me start by um, saying that mostly I'm going to explain how we regulate gene edited uh, organisms for agriculture in Argentina and other Latin American countries. And first of all, um, the baseline, our approach is to decide if a product uh, improved using uh, gene editing is uh, GMO or not. So basically we, we recognize that we have two boxes, it's either a GMO 
or perhaps it's a mute, it's like a mutant uh, obtained by uh, an, a new mutagenesis technique. So we put the products in one box or the other. They, the most important part is to understand how we do that um, separation. And the separation is based in the Cartagena protocol definition of GMO, which is embedded in the Argentine regulations and in the regulations of many Latin American countries and a lot of countries around the world. And as it has been said, perhaps from the outside, it looks like the problem with the, with the European Court of Justice rallying was not the judges, it was the definition that they are using as uh, Europe is using a definition that is not the universally accepted one or the one that was consensuated in the Cartagena Protocol. In the, in the definition, uh, an LMO or a GMO, an LMO in the Cartagena Protocol language, GMO in the national regulations, is an organism that has a novel combination of genetic material. And here, please, Take a look at this uh, image we, uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, which is a map. It's a map of techniques. And in the horizontal dimension, that arrow tries to separate different cases uh, regarding novel combination of genetic material. From, from technologies where there is no change in DNA sequences to technologies where there is just a simple mutation or technologies where you end up with an insertion. Also, a GMO this novel combination of genetic material must have been obtained using recombinant DNA techniques. So again in the map, in the vertical dimension, you can see techniques classified uh, regarding if recombinant DNA has been used or not. In some techniques, recombinant DNA is not put in contact with the uh, organism in any, in any moment. Uh, in others, uh, there is recombinant DNA involved temporarily. And uh, in some of them, recombinant DNA is permanently integrated into the final product. And finally, this must be made uh, in a way that they uh, overcome or cannot be reproduced by uh, natural um, breeding. The, therefore, taking all of this into consideration and using this map as a, as a visual guide, uh, we can discriminate products that are considered GMOs from products that are not considered GMOs. And of course, the most important part here is if they have a novel combination of genetic material or not in the final product. We have this, uh, we, we can uh, uh, codify this in a decision tree. This is the Argentine one, but it's very similar to the one being used in other Latin American countries. Even there are African countries having, or, um, having uh, regulations or draft regulations with decision maps like this. Uh, the trigger is the use of recombinant DNA, somehow, even when it's not putting, supposedly not put in contact with the, um, with the organism, because that needs to be assessed by an independent uh, expert. So if recombinant DNA is used somehow, the developer must come to the regulatory office and present the case. Then the regulator, <coughs> the Biosafety Commission, will assess if there is a novel combination of, uh, of genetic material or not in the final product. And uh, depending on that, basically, it is decided if the product is considered a GMO or not. If it is considered a GMO, it is handled as, a, as any other GMO. If not, it is handled by the regulator of conventional products. And besides, we mine the gap between the two regulatory systems. This means that if the Biosafety Commission for GMOs, the GMO regulator, says this is not my business, this is not the GMO, but we see a risk hypothesis, then we communicate the risk hypothesis to both the developer and to the regulator of conventional products. So that risk hypothesis is not, is not missed. Some, somebody deals with it. And something that is very relevant to to, to highlight in Argentina and, ma and in many other countries, conventional products or products coming from other breeding techniques, uh, other mutagenesis techniques, they are regulated. They must be presented to the government. And if there is a, a specific risk hypothesis, the government will do a risk analysis. The problem with GMOs is that we do risk analysis even if we don't have risk hypothesis. But conventional products, there is risk analysis if there is a risk hypothesis. For instance, taking the, the, the example that Greg uh, provided of the peanut. Let, let's suppose a peanut that was gene edited 
uh, an allergenic gene was inactivated, so it doesn't work anymore. It comes to the Biosafety Commission. Biosafety Commission says there is nothing inserted. It's just a point mutation. This is not a GMO. But even when the developer claims that the allergen has been reduced a thousand times, perhaps one of a thousand of the allergen is, is still uh, dangerous. And it will be dangerous to say to the consumer that this is a hypoallergenic product. So the GMO regulator will say this is not a GMO, but they have this risk hypothesis. And the risk hypothesis will be communicated, for instance, to the food code. Because at least in Argentina, you cannot just say that something is hypoallergenic uh, freely. You, that, must, the, that category of an hypoallergenic food for that particular food must be uh, anticipated in the food code and the product be evaluated under certain parameters to be able to, to say that, to have that claim. Okay. Um, so after we develop this uh, way of uh, sorting out if a product is a GMO or not, we immediately started to share this with uh, the international community, with other regulators through publications in, in Spanish and in English languages, so we could accelerate the, the exchange of ideas, covering many different aspects, not, not only how to decide if it is a GMO or not, but also how to do the safety assessment if necessary, how to um, consider the potential societal impacts of regulating one way or another, and even many very specific issues like uh, off-target effects uh, that are new to, to at least to, to this kind of, re of regulators. We also engage uh, a lot with uh, the, our internal Argentine public. This uh, is in English, it has been translated for, for, for or you're easy of understanding, but originally these are publications in Spanish, ref in the press, saying how Argentine government has engaged with um, journalists, with the general public, with breeders, with different strates of, uh, of different layers of society to present this regulation, to get feedback, and to fine tune the regulation. And we have also, of course, been discussing and presenting this to other countries from countries that are also um, important agricultural producers and users of agricultural biotechnology like the United States, Brazil, South Africa, uh, but uh, as well we have been exchanging of course with our potential or, or real customers of agri-food products including China, up to a moment including Russia, including the European Union. And we have also shared this in multilateral fora in the Americas, Inter-American Fora, the G20, when Argentina chaired the G20 a couple of years ago. Uh, even Argentina presented a declaration in the SPS Committee of the World Trade Organization. It was backed by several countries, uh, pledging for the international community to start discussing this and try avoiding a, a trade clash in the future. And of course, um, one, one of the main fora for discussing this is the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Cartagena Protocol. And we have been there uh, leading other countries in delivering the message that the uh, Cartagena Protocol definition for LMO uh, does not uh, include uh, certain products from Chino America. Here you, this, this is an, an interesting timeline. You can see the um, approvals GMOs in Argentina beginning in 1996, that's, that's the blue dots and the blue lines uh, cover, it's a, it's a moving average, the blue line is a moving average covering every, every Argentine presidency, so one presidency after the other, uh, our government has been approving GMOs uh, for commercialization in agriculture, and then in green you can see the moment when we started to take decisions if certain products from Chino Meditin and other innovative breeding techniques are GMOs or not. And you can uh, compare uh, the dynamics of, of, or, or the trends in, in both uh, decisions. Also, you, you may spot some stars uh, over there. Uh, those stars represent products that the developer presented as non-GMOs, uh, saying I'm using CRISPR, so this is not a GMO, right? And the regulators say, no, there is a novel combination of genetic material there. This is a um, GMO. And this 
uh, is also in line that, uh, with the idea that the, this cannot be self-determined. It must have, you must have an independent biosafety commission or group of experts deciding if the definition of GMO applies or not to every product. That case load that I showed in the previous slide, uh, you can see here represented in another way. First of all, please uh, take a look at the um, a pie chart. That's the distribution, um, among those <coughs> products that were not considered GMOs, how many of them were obtained using gene editing, uh, properly speaking, or how many of them were obtained using other innovative breeding techniques, for instance, epigenetic modification. Most is gene editing, as you can see, but let's not forget that there are other uh, modern biotechnology techniques um, um, available and being used to obtain new products. Then, uh, if you go to the left, um, that's the case log of products from innovative breeding technologies, mostly genome edited, presented in the first five years. You, you can see products that are animals, microorganisms, and not just plants, the three, the three kingdoms. And you can see that there are several interesting traits uh, of societal relevance today, like um, traits related with uh, climate change resilience, traits related to consumer health benefit, uh, to uh, animal welfare. If we compare that to the caseload of GMOs approved in Argentina over 25 years, so five times the, 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 that amount of time, the diversity is much restricted. So we don't see any a genetically modified animal uh, approved for commercial use in, in Argentina. Only one kind of microorganism uh, based uh, vaccines uh, for veterinary use uh, based on live mic uh, recombinant microorganisms. And on the plant side, it's mostly herbicide tolerance and insect protection. So no, no, not so much diversity in traits. So here we can see how genome editing, is, since it is bringing more players and smaller players uh, to try developing products. They, they are exploring other niches that big companies do not explore because of the, the have not explored uh, when they uh, would only uh, work with GMOs and products that have to suffer the GMO regulation. Is, this one has been shown yesterday, the same case load. Five years of presentations uh, regarding innovative green techniques, mostly gene editing, versus 25 years of GMOs. In 25 years of GMOs, most of the uh, proponents taking this to the market were foreign big multinational companies. Why? Because it's expensive, difficult. It's politically, in, you have political instability or, or, or you're not sure if the politician is going to, to approve it in the end. There are national products, fortunately, but are a minority. Then when we go to genome editing, there is an explosion. It's not like multinationals are not interested. They are working on it. But then you have a plethora of developers in the public and private sector that come into play. And, uh, sorry, another thing that is not shown here, the, the, the big blue in GMO nowadays is only four <coughs> companies, while on the other side is like 20, com 20 different companies. So it's, it's not just a matter of the quantity of presentations, it's also a matter of the number of companies competing uh, among each other. And here's some specific examples that show how this kind of regulation that we deem adequate uh, fit for purpose, uh, is attracting public and private uh, investment. Ar Argentina doesn't have big pockets uh, for um, approving new f or, uh, funding for research, so Argentina didn't create new funding for specifically doing research in genome editing or for funding entrepreneurship in genome editing, no, no new fresh, no fresh money for that. But since we had this regulation and also our neighbors, including Brazil, um, follow it with the same regulation, public and private investment appear spontaneously. Here, first example, our National Institute of Agricultural Technology had funds and resources 
to develop GM crops, but since those GM crops were quite unlikely to actually reach the market, a lot of that existing uh, capability was redirected to develop gene edited crops, having more, much more um, uh, hopes of, re uh, of reaching the market, more, more chances. We have companies like BioEveries that were, uh, this, are, this is a, an example of a startup created solely because we had this regulation. It, it is focused on developing uh, gene, edited, gene edited crops. If we didn't have this regulation, this startup would not exist. This startup began in 2016 after our regulation was launched, and nowadays it even has a branch in the United States, so it, it has become more than Argentinian. And there are many of these startups. This is another one, uh, interesting just because they are working in, in cannabis. So by now, they are working on reducing the amount of uh, uh, controlled substances in cannabis so it can be used uh, industrial, but of course in the future they can do other modifications always uh, under the law, of course. And, uh, for instance, we have established companies, existing companies like Don Mario. Don Mario is a, is a small Argentine multinational selling seeds in several countries. And this uh, Argentine company up to now, up, up to 2015, all biotech crops that they had were licensed from big, bigger uh, multinational biotech companies because they didn't have a capability of developing their own products, their own biotech uh, products, I mean. But now, after Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, main markets of Don Mario have uh, this uh, regulation in place, then Don Mario have uh, invested in a genome editing lab and they are developing their own products. Uh, what I'm describing is not happening only in regards to plants. It's also, as, I, as, as shown before, it's happening uh, also in the animal field. Here an example where, again, in the Argentine National Institute of Agricultural Technology, researchers working in reducing the amount of allergens in cow milk. Or a um, National uh, University of Buenos Aires scientists uh, working on removing the mud and cow disease uh, protein from cows, um, from, from cow genome. Or uh, this is uh, an Argentine company that existed previously, a, a small company, working on animal cloning. So uh, previously they were cloning, for instance, polo horses and, and, and other kind of farm animals. Uh, after we issued this regulation with the technologies and the people that the resources that they have, they could easily incorporate genome editing. Uh, and they have been working on uh, doing genome editing in different kind of animals. Nowadays, they even have a joint venture with another small U.S. company to uh, exchange trades between the two countries. And finally, um, this is what I have been describing so far is not only happening in Argentina. Uh, you can see the same in Brazil, in Chile, in Colombia, in those countries also reports of um, public research or uh, entrepreneurs or small companies coming from abroad and making joint ventures to bring uh, gene edited products to the market. Uh, of course, first step going to the government, government, government saying that this is not a, a GMO. From the, in the first five, we issued our regulation in 2015. In only five years, other seven Latin American countries follow it and have the same approach. And of course, there are others in the region considering to, to do the same. And even in, in Latin American countries that still have not made their mind in the regulatory office, like Costa Rica, the researchers are... Uh, focusing on this because they, they have high hopes that they can, the government will soon follow this trend of other Latin American countries, or at least they could go to the neighbor Honduras, and for instance, and, pres and present their products over there. With this, uh, I finish. Um, I suggest the free, uh, three free papers that you can find online. That QR code goes to my LinkedIn page, and in there you can download these, these papers with more information about the Argentine um, experience and in this regard. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Lima, for this um, interesting overview. And uh, as you can see, he is leaving, but he will be available definitely for the questions during the coffee break, I'm afraid. The clock is ticking. <laughs> so we have our last speaker coming up. It is Gwen Swinnen, who represents here the Gene Sprout Initiative. Can you hear me? Good, great. Okay, let's see if this works. Hmm. Does not. Ah, it does. Okay, great. So, um, still a good morning um, to everyone, and thank you in advance for your attention. I know that it's the last presentation of this session, so please bear with me. There will be a coffee break after this. Um, as was already mentioned, my name is Yuan Sunen, and I am um, an early career uh, researcher from Belgium, where I um, obtained my PhD by um, using genome editing in tomato. And now I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher in Switzerland. And during my PhD, I, I realized that I was not only um, passionate about the science itself, but also about communicating it. And so today I stand here before you as a board member of Gene Sprout Initiative, which is a collective of um, young plant scientists who believe in the power of open dialogue when it comes to the future of genome editing. So I want to start out this presentation by showing you the faces behind Gene Sprout Initiative. So currently we have 12 active members. All of them are either master students, PhD students, uh, or postdocs in plant sciences, and they are located in different um, European countries. And something that, that all of us um, have in common is that we are all passionate about our studies, about our research. And not just for the fun of it, but because we hope that our findings can have a positive impact on society. And to that end, many of us are using genome editing. Miguel here, for instance, he is um, he's trying to make tomato plants resistant against a fungal disease that is caused by uh, botrytis and which leads to devastating yield losses. And he's doing that by using genome editing. And as I'm sure you'll realize, uh, we've also already seen that during previous talks, if your plants are resistant to a certain disease, you take away the need for uh, pesticides to, to prevent or uh, treat infections by that fungus. Another one of our members, uh, Ramon, what he is doing, he is investigating how to reduce the amount of a specific type um, of sugars um, in the common bean that our bodies are just not able um, to digest. And like that, he is trying to improve the nutritional quality um, of these beans, again, using genome editing. And um, as a final example, that's, that's me over there. <laughs> Um, I myself, I am researching um, the genes that underlie the differences um, between the tomato troughs on the left and on the one on the right. So the one on the left is the typical single branched um, tomato troughs uh, that you find in the supermarket, um, while the one on the right, it consists of multiple branches. And obviously this, this impacts uh, fruit yield, so by Figuring this out, I'm trying to optimize fruit yield um, and, um, well, again, by using, I guess you can already guess, <laughs> genome editing. And so this, this, what I would call a drive to contribute to developing plant varieties that can positively impact society is something that not only holds true for our members, but for so, so many um, early career researchers all over Europe and, of course, also outside of Europe. And so all of us, we are, I would almost dare to say, wholeheartedly devoted to creating knowledge and developing solutions for more sustainable fruit production. In other words, we want our research to actually mean something. And as I think has already become 
increasingly clear throughout this conference, genome editing is no silver bullet, but with its versatility, um, its accuracy, its ease of use, it holds enormous potential to help us do that. So, keeping that potential in mind, it may come as no surprise to you that many of us are very worried about how plants obtained by genome editing are currently regulated in the EU because it can actually impact our future. And so, as scientists, we are concerned about the negative impacts it can have on the funding of our research. So, the opposite effect of what um, our previous speaker um, has just exemplified in, uh, in Argentina. And of course, also, um, we are worried about future job opportunities if we want to stay within the EU or within our home countries. But even more importantly than that, is that as citizens, we are concerned that the current legislation is restricting the use of genome editing to benefit society. And that brings me to one of the main reasons we started this initiative. And that is to voice the opinions of plant science students and early career researchers on policies that are related to a genome editing. And for this reason, we wrote an open letter um, to the Commission in the spring of 2021 to welcome the results um, and the conclusions of the EC study on NGTs and also to explain why we believe that we, as young scientists, deserve a seat at that table. And so we were very happy to actually be included as stakeholders in the, uh, the impact assessment um, on the legislation, on the legislative initiative, by contributing to the study, um, supporting that impact assessment in the form of an interview and also a targeted stakeholder study. And of course, we also um, we contributed to the, the Commission's uh, public consultation um, for which we uh, saw a bit of a summary or some of the key issues were highlight highlighted by uh, Irene. Uh, Sanchez during her talk yesterday. And of course, we're also very glad to be invited as speakers and as panelists in events um, like the one here. Um, but also, for instance, um, we had here a discussion organized by EU40, the network of young MEPs on new breeding techniques. Um, there was the Commission's high-level um, event on NGDs that uh, Irina Sanchez also mentioned yesterday, where we had a panelist and also um, the European researchers' night. And we also, next to that, next to wanting to be able to voice our opinions, we also recognize the role that scientists, and specifically young scientists, can play in facilitating um, open dialogue with the general public. Because um, while we may not have the same level of expertise, as I can put it, that, if I can put it that way, as more established scientists, we can often be perceived as more approachable. And that is something we have actually experienced on several occasions during science communication events that we have participated in or that we have organized ourselves. It's that people feel actually comfortable to come to us with their questions, with their concerns. And what we do in return is provide them with honest answers, and that gets appreciated. So that's one of the um, important reasons why we believe that uh, young scientists have an important part to play in science communication. Another one is that we can share our passion with people we can spark their curiosity, and we can make them excited about plant sciences. And that's through social media, which also allows us to reach a younger generation of citizens. And what we want to do with these social media posts is to create content that is not only easy to digest, but that's also fun to digest, because science is fun, right? And here are actually some of the examples um, that we have been focusing on. 
which are actually stories that anything that's exciting and plant science related, like how plants in fact, they are aware that there are other plants surrounding them. Like they know that they're not alone. So we talk to people about that. We explain then how that works in very simple terms. Um, but also um, stories about um, inspiring CRISPR applications in crops like the vitamin D uh, enriched tomatoes that were already mentioned yesterday. But we also interact um, with our followers through small quizzes and polls where there's always room for a joke or two or maybe more. And next to that, we also want to inform people um, about anything that is related to NGT policy. So both actually inside and outside of the EU in an easy to understand way um, because we feel that they have the right to know, like the recently published uh, results of the public consultation. So to sum that up, in essence, um, what it is we are trying to do here is we are trying to introduce the general public to the fascinating, so, so fascinating, I cannot um, highlight that enough, world of plant sciences and with that inspire them to take part in the conversation on the future of scientific advances like genome editing. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. And um, here I would just like to take this opportunity just to highlight again the main goals of our initiative, which are we want to inspire young students and researchers, both inside and outside of Europe, that we can and we must have a voice in, that, in policies that will dictate our future. As the next generation of plant sciences, we feel that it is our responsibility to openly and honestly communicate about not only genome editing, but plant sciences in general. And last, but certainly not least, <laughs> by what we are doing, we hope that other uh, students and early career scientists will follow suit. Meaning we want to encourage them to um, join discussions and science communication platforms like our own, we're always happy to take new members, um, or join other ones um, like Ecoproc, from which you will hear uh, in the next session, or why not even start their own initiative. So thank you for your attention. And um, if you haven't already, we invite you to uh, check out our social media pages. Thank you very much, Ms. Winnen, for the very inspiring speech. Um, the exchange of questions and answers would have to wait for the coffee break, too. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention, too. And now it's your time for refreshment. So the coffee break is prepared outside of the hall. And please be back at 11.20. It means we have like roughly 30 minutes for coffee and refreshment. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, take your seats, please. And welcome back to the conference. I hope you relaxed a bit because we have a very important topic ahead. <laughs> we might have, have great findings, might even prepare a legislative, but without people accepting the changes, as was already mentioned a couple of times, it would be quite a challenge to put the use of NGTs through. So the session four discusses the social sorry, aspect and communication about plant breeding innovations. And as the per first speaker, please welcome on stage Michaela Šojdrová, a member of the European Parliament from the Czech Republic. Thank you. So, thank you very much for us, uh, politicians, the communication. Sometimes is uh, really priority. However, I prefer the, the objectives, the subject, the results, the program, the outcomes, but the, the communication uh, is uh, so important, maybe now more as uh, before, because we, uh, we are living in the, in the life uh, in social media, so uh, we may be faced to the spread so um, many information that we should distinguish and to, to try to find the best. Um, it's an honor to be with you on this conference. And uh, we have heard uh, many things uh, which are very important for us as legislators for our next steps. I really appreciate the participation of our guests abroad, from Germany, from uh, uh, United States, uh, Argentina, Switzerland. So thank you very much. Uh, please, can you? Uh, I have so. Yeah, maybe. Yes, that's the first picture. First of all, I would like to explain why I decided to enter the NGT debate and uh, address this topic at the EU level. Um, I am landscape architect, landscape and uh, garden architect, but in politics uh, I am now, I, I do it more than 26 years. Uh, so um, I use really to focus uh, how to improve the life, the human life, how to uh, achieve the better conditions for the life. And in this topic, I found that there is a basic disparity, that we import some specific products, GMO crops, into the EU, we use them as feed for our cattle, but we have banned ourselves from growing the same crops within the EU. To me, as a citizen, that is information that I do not understand. I should say that the subject of my political work was not agriculture, um, unfortunately. I, made, I did uh, um, uh, educational policy. So when I discovered to two years ago, this disparity. I, I said I should do something, uh, we, we should move. That's why I welcome this conference and special this session in tight societal aspect and communication about plant breeding innovations. Uh, I apologize, maybe in my speech, I will repeat something what we heard. Um, because I prepared it before, but I will, I will be not so long, I have only three pictures. Without any doubt, the current situation has its, soci uh, has, uh, its social causes and social consequences. If I take it from the perspective of the European scientific community, 
EU and from the perspective of the European farmers, I know them, um, we see that the way for a new beginning in the use of plant breeding in European agriculture is opening. It is clear that the times are changing, we have heard. The previous part of the conference were dedicated to how genomic techniques have evolved, what their potential for sustainability is and what impact they can have. This potential is evident based on both research and practical experience. We have now reached a stage in breeding methods where we are able to ensure the production of plants with the characteristic we need in a short period of time and at an affordable cost. Scientists and farmers agree on the advantage of this method. So the conclusions of the previous session confirmed and speakers agreed on the rightness to use these new genomic techniques to ensure food security through environmentally friendly cultivation methods. But on the way to achieving this lo logical use on NGTs, we face some obstacles we should go with, with them. There is a contradiction because GMOs have been known for a long time and have been produced mostly outside the EU and only partly with within the EU. However, GMOs are imported, uh, are, uh, imported uh, into the EU, which makes the EU farmers uncompetitive. Although the beginning of research, I, I guess, I, I, as I know, the beginning of the research and the main discoveries happen in Europe. Uh, in this, I see a paradox. We don't use it, but we invent it. This problem is highlighted through the frequent vote on is really highlighted on the frequent vote on the import of the GM crops into the EU. My colleague, my distinguished colleague uh, Tom van den Candelare, I'm very happy he's here. He can uh, he can confirm that the European Parliament regularly votes on objections on import of GMOs, especially GMO soy, <laughs> maize, and cotton, regularly. Um, in the la I should say, uh, friendly, that uh, in, the, in the last year I vote every time in favour of these objections. It means that I am against import. Why? Because I don't want to import something which, what we cannot produce in Europe. It's my approach. But the Greens, he initiated this objections usually, they vote in favor uh, from different reasons, because they don't, they don't want, as, uh, maybe ideologically, they have a different reasons. But we vote al almost every uh, plenary session about objections. In this context, I see a question. How did the aversion to GM crops arise? My uh, colleague uh, Herbert, uh, this morning, he mentioned one of the reasons. Um, as I know, and you can maybe uh, discuss, the reason for the aversion was a failure to communicate, to communicate and inform about the risk influence of large companies that wanted to use GM crops and seeds in the EU and the beginning of the millennium. But we should, uh, I don't want to return and to, um, to, to go to details, but it was mentioned that the transparency and the trust for communication is a base. So we should, we should know where, where is the, uh, was the, this uh, mistake. That is why it's so important not to make the same mistake with NGTs. It is therefore necessary to dispel myths and doubts. That does not mean that the risks do not exist. They do exist and they need to be discussed. Uh, for example, the question is the impact on biodiversity. Another question is the unavailability of seeds for small farmers or the dominance of large, uh, large research centres and companies. 
uh, we are aware of this risk and they must be addressed during the legislative process in order to avoid the negative impact and mistrust of the pe people. I see it as crucial. We, sh we, cannot, we cannot allow to mistrust uh, the, uh, of the people. How we can communicate this topic? Uh, I think the best example was uh, the Jens Proud initiative from I, our colleague from Switzerland. Uh, maybe it is a really good example and thank you to be here with us and to share your project. It is important to find the right way of communicating and to explain the topic of NGT to each group in a way that suits their needs. Uh, communication must be transparent, transfer, so that each target group knows that we are telling the science-based fact and that there are no other interests behind. It was mentioned too, nothing is uh, hidden. Uh, as a contribution to better communication, I initiated a study with the title Genome, Genome Edited Crops, a European Perspective. This study will serve as a communication tool. I will speak in the last uh, picture. In September 2022, the European Commission published a summary of public consultation. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, this, uh, Sanchez uh, um, mentioned this. The report is based on almost 2,200 contributions from 23 uh, member states. And it's important that almost 80% of respondents consider the current legal framework insufficient for NGTs and expect a change in legislation. Uh, this view was expressed by large majority of citizens, research institutions, business associations, as well as public authorities. It shows clearly the call of different stakeholders for a legislative change. I think we can interpret, we can have this interpretation, but we should to, uh, to uh, discuss on this more. In the third part of uh, my presentation, I, I would like to highlight that European Parliament is a very useful partner uh, for communication. The numerous committee and plenary meetings, roundtables and other discussions provide great opportunities for exchanging views and finding common ground. In the European Parliament, we set the agenda and the topic for discussion. Uh, Herbert Dorfan mentioned uh, his report uh, on uh, Firm to Fork. Really, I would like to highlight it was uh, more than uh, a year ago, 2021. And there is mention that we um, take note that the uh, Commission will prepare new, new legislative as answer to the decision of European Court. So it is more than one year and nothing on the table, uh, only public consultations, uh, only result of public consultations. So it's really not, uh, not enough. Um, we also have the opportunity for intense debate with our governments and with citizens in our constituencies. That's why I prepared this study for the communication with my people, with our citizens. It's in English, but I hope it will be translated. Um, I am uh, very uh, glad that the uh, Czech Ministry of Agriculture, during the Czech Presidency, acknowledges uh, the importance of the use of NGTs. Um, in one week, uh, in the beginning of uh, ten, 10 days, uh, we, uh, in the beginning of November, we will have a conference here in Prague about uh, food security and the first part of the conference is about a new genomic, uh, new genomic techniques and biotechnologies. So uh, clearly Czech governments recognized this uh, tools, this, um, this measure uh, for the food security. I'm very happy for this. Um, let me conclude uh, my speech, my presentation. 
uh, this presentation of the study because we have here at the authors. I would like really thanks uh, to uh, EU Sage, uh, Oana and Rene, they contributed uh, to this uh, um, uh, study, to this uh, review, and our Czech uh, researchers, uh, uh, Mr. Dolezel, Mr. Honis, and others who are uh, who took part of the of this uh, uh, review, uh, study review. How we won't say the what I appreciate is that you. For me, it will be really something uh, for communication for public, as uh, our sweet, uh, sweet, uh, uh, our colleague from Switzerland said. It's for young people. For me, it's for the target group 50 plus. I think, uh, but uh, it's uh, possible to use for uh, for everyone. Uh, uh, and there is a European perspective as whole on the 17 pages and uh, for uh, two pages are dedicated to Czech national uh, perspective. So I will propose to my dear uh, European colleague to use it, they can use for their communication and to, to add their national perspective and they will be available, um, I think it's a very uh, valuable uh, tool uh, for their debate with people because we should really disseminate and uh, um, to, uh, this communication to allow this communication and knowledge. Um, let me conclude uh, with uh, the quote from the new study just uh, in the um, in my introductory remark, I really call that European agriculture faced the main challenge how to mitigate the impact of climate change on our agriculture, ensure food security and nutrition, as well as support the competitiveness of European farmers. I really thanks to our German colleague because he said that we should show the positive impact. Also in the US, they don't hesitate to show the positive impact, the positive uh, uh, what, what we can achieve uh, with this. So we face legislative obstacle. The, vi the wide use of NGTs in the EU is not possible due to very strict EU legislation, which de facto blocks the introduction of the new varieties resulting from genome editing on the European market. So, we open large public discussion and our campaign in order to inform the people, stakeholders, politicians, that there is a solution for our European challenges. We will do it. Europe as a task is the motto of the Czech presidency. And I add food security is a task for all of us. It's our responsibility. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Chodrova. Does anybody have any questions? Maybe later. Maybe later. Okay, there is one question. Thank you. How would you evaluate the situation in the council at the moment, the voting situation? I think from the point of view of uh, my country, it's, it's positive. But uh, from the point of view of the other, uh, I think we should start to test. I don't know. Um, uh, we should start discussion. I will ask our Czech Minister of Agriculture to raise this proposal and to start. It's absolutely necessary. So uh, I think uh, it, you are absolutely right question because I remember very well we solved uh, more than three, four years ago the question of uh, dual quality of uh, food. It was a long time discuss, discussion before and when uh, came our Minister of Agriculture agriculture, our EPP, Maria Nurechka, in council of a minister. He tabled this issue. He asked commission to prepare the change, the change of the directive. It was done. 
So it's really necessary that co council is much more active. <coughs> but I cannot say, I don't know, in Belgium, I don't know, in Germany, but in Czech, I think we are very open. Thank you for the nice presentation. Just a short question. Maybe I missed it. Um, this uh, study which you just presented, will it be publicly available on a of website? Course. Of course, there is in my website and um, it's available for two. It's, it was made by public money, it, so it is public. <laughs> so, thank you. so you can find it online? Right it's now. fine. Now it's online in website www.soydrova.cz. Yes. Thank you very much, Mrs. Shoydrova. Thanks. Thank you. The next minutes will belong to Christian Kaiser from the Cluster of Excellence on Plant Science in Germany, who is, among else, also a science communicator. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Christian. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Düsseldorf in this uh, class of excellence, but I'm also on the other side, besides working on, for example, plant microbe interactions, I'm also doing a bit on human-human interaction, working in science communication. First of all, for, the for example, for one of the initiatives that we're running, which is the Give Genes a Chance initiative, together with the Gene Sprouts. Um, this is really going down into one of the NGOs, which I'm part of, and I've co-founded, which is an initiative of young researchers, which are not only a plant breeding initiative, but more, or more trying to, like, do a little revolution in the environmental NGO field to being a science-based NGO really in the core. So today I want to um, start off. Next talk will go to Svenja, which will explain more in a more in a practical way what we're doing, how we utilize these concepts, but I will really go down into communication concepts that have changed the way how we are communicating. That goes down to work of communication experts, for example, at the Replanet Alliance, but also some workshop we had by the Alliance for Science. But I just want to collect some of these points to show you how we can discuss these topics from knowledge, sorry, from knowledge to values. So, how did I got into this? And the interesting point is, is I was not a scientist when I came into this debate. I was, in the beginning, a politician. I was one of the members of the Green Youth in, in uh, Germany and was running for state offices at this point. But at some point, some friends came to me and asked me, hey, Christian, you're one of the few life science students that we're having. Do you want to write a statement on NGTs? And I was like, yes, why not? So I jumped into this debate. And my whole life, I was surrounded by this. I was surrounded by the perspective of corn cobs with syringes, biosafety labels. So I was thinking, okay, it will be likely something like this. But then at some point, I met people like, for example, David Spencer, which is also one of the founders of the Gift Genes a Chance initiative. And as a scientist in training, I also started to look into publication. And for some reason, it didn't match the perspective that I saw on this side. And it's still, oh, wrong direction. And it's also still reflected in the German public today, with about two thirds still rejecting NGTs. So obviously, I thought to myself, okay, why is the scientific side and the public side so quite different, so polarized? Why are having you, do we have this debate between the good and the evil, basically? And this is, I think, also a really nice illustration sharing that from Kurz gesagt in Germany. Okay, I think it really goes down if we really ask ourselves why we have these problems, and I think Mr. Pronhagen already gave a good start for that, is that we need to make sense of a world which is quite complex. And it goes for everyone. So we are in the universe, obviously, we have a green planet, we have societies, and then there's us. And all of us need constantly to make decisions. Sometimes we think about having a coffee, sometimes we think about whether we should spend our money, like you more coffee, and sometimes in between we think about whether we should regulate plant breeding differently. So, <laughs> that's a normal situation, right? So, what does that mean? So again, well, it's quite complex, and not only, not only layperson have problems with that, every scientist can also agree. We can only glim glimpse into part of the details that are around us, and there's far more science being present that we would need for like, a super found decision-making that we can actually comprehend. Therefore, it's really good that we have mental shortcuts, that we have a way to identify reliable sources of information. So actually, all these heuristics, for example, Mr. Pernhagen has mentioned, they are, can, can lead to problems, but on the other side, they help us also to make quick decisions. Okay, so obviously there's a need to provide information. And one of these ways is science communication. And there have been two predominant models in science communication. The first one is the one that I also experienced most of my life, which is scientists on stages, which is scientists on television, which is books, which go from the idea that all these polarization and controversies that we're seeing coming from a knowledge deficit. So if you educate, us, uh, educate the public, these opinions should change. But there has been in the last decades a change to a different model, 
which is the dialogue-based models, which goes from a different perspective. There's not a problem of knowledge on its own, but it's a problem of the ability to identify valid signs. And to dive into this, let's start with scientific literacy. And there's a point to the knowledge problem. So if you're looking, for example, at US consumers, one third doesn't know that there's DNA in vegetables. But the positive note to this, while there is low knowledge, or at least modest knowledge in science, there's a high interest in understanding science. There's a curiosity in us. And it's also true for the European citizens. There's within this Eurobarometer last year, which investigated these issues, and it came to the point that nine out of 10 Europeans see science as something positive, and also around 50% think it actually benefits their lives. And there's another thing. Who should communicate science? Who should be the reliable source? And there's also good information from the Eurobarometer that scientists in the public sector and also scientists in the private sector are the most renowned sources of these informations. So what does that mean for us? First of all, there's a lack of knowledge. There's an interest in this lack of knowledge to be filled based on the interest in these scientific topics. There's a trust in science and there's a trust in scientists. So very good preconditions, right? But one of the questions that scientists on science literacy, uh, scientific communication have asked is whether scientific literacy is actually enough. And uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that run in, in this, these um, experiments were whether higher literacy actually leads to a less polarized view, whether with more education we get less of these controversies that we're seeing. An interesting thing is that it's actually, for issues like for climate change, there's no correlation between like, scientific literacy and the ability to answer this question correctly. And this really goes down into these different social groups that we're adhering to. One of the results that came out from this is if we separate it, we can see there's a strong separation between political groups in the US, for example, and that actually with a higher scientific literacy, we get a more polar polarized view, which is obviously, which obviously pointing to, which point to the points <laughs> towards that scientific literacy is not really the indicator if we have a controversy or not. And that goes down to one concept, which is basically confirmation bias, uh, which has been termed identity protective cognition. And that's the idea that we're rather credit in the information that we're getting, or whether we credit an expert as an expert, depending on the social group that you're adhering to. This can be everything. It can be gender, it can be politics, it can be a social group, it can be a local identity and so on. So in this case, again, with conservatives and Democrats in the US, um, the, the, the expert is seen as credible in the moment it, the, the opinion refers to the already existing consensus in the group. Okay, to put it a bit more simple, and also to think about what is the rationale behind all of this, if you're thinking about a group and everyone is like agreeing that chocolate is like the only one food that you need in your life, but then there's this one person saying, okay, we should eat vegetables maybe, sometimes. Um, this can lead to quite big disruptions if this is part of the identity of the group. That means there is, because we're often thinking of this like irrational that we have these views or something, or why people are misled on science. But there are also social costs associated with having a certain opinion. And if your group is agreeing that this is the consensus and the one consensus to follow, then this can lead to, to a rational decision to rather be invalid on science than lose your grips to the group. Okay, what does it mean for science communicators? We are usually the odd one out. You're, we are the one going into new groups. So that means we always need to credit what group are we actually adhering to. Are we in this moment seen as an opponent or are we seen as a credible expert by the group that we're talking to? Okay, and one of the things that pop up here is values. And let's go into this. And again, from the Eurobarometer, there's also an interesting point to so the question whether it's only knowledge. From the perspective of citizens, it's not. Moral and ethical issues are more important than whether technology can be actually innovative. That means we need to think about values and the ways we communicate. And there is a pretty easy and simplistic scheme that I really like because obviously most of us are not psych social psychologists, also me not. I'm also not one, so therefore uh, it's quite helpful to have some schemes to think about these things and not needing to go through everything. And I think these moral foundations by Hyde are a quite good scheme for this. And what, they often what they can show us in the anti-GMO and pro-GMO debate is that we're often not talking the same language. Because a lot of the debate that we have been doing also in the last day really attends to the side here which, agree which is care, which is fairness, loyalty. So we're talking about saving a planet, securing food security. We want a regulatory scheme that is fair so that plant breeders, depending on if they have the same trade, they are regulated in the same way. We think about loyalty so the states should keep their approvals and so on. But a lot of the anti-GMO debate is actually all on the other side. And one of the core factors that is always communicated is this point of sanity and degradation. And that goes down into this situation. So there is only a point that we see in nature as something positive, and this is also called 
the green fallacy, so the idea that nature is inherently good. And this can be very separated onto two narratives that we can strongly see in this debate. And the first narrative is harmony with nature is something that we need to submit ourselves, that we need to submit ourselves to nature, get back to this primal positive state in which we're not corrupting the system. And on the other side, we have mastery of nature, which is far more going into the direction of humanistic perspective. So we're thinking about embracing technology, going into modern age, getting people to food and all that stuff. So um, but why these, both of these sides might have arguments and the way we see them in media and reflected in our society um, is quite different. So naturalness is all around us all of the time. We're putting a smile back on the planet with organic, like in, for example, this political campaign by the Greens. We're having a, a, a butterfly landing on a grass on a non-GMO label in the US. We have toilet paper, which for some reason needs to be natural. We have ham that needs to be natural. So it's all around us. We are constant, <laughs> sorry. We're constantly touching naturalness as something very positive. Everyone that loves nature. And on the other side, mastery of nature, we're thinking about dystopias and so on. We're thinking about exploding nuclear reactors. We're thinking of getting out of control. So a lot of the negative views are really adhering to this mastery of nature, embracing technology perspective. And again, this is something which is really nicely also seen in this debate. And this also adheres to these heuristics that Mr. Pernhagen has also mentioned. I want to mention two here, which first of all is effect heuristics, which is that we value information higher if it causes strong emotions. And obviously these images which are still used, for example, this stuff by Foodwatch is like three weeks ago, I think, in one of the petitions that we're running. It's biosafety labels, it's Franken food, it's green, positive, um, no GMO labels like in Germany. Uh, so they're connected with strong positive or negative emotions. On the other side, they're very available, they're everywhere. So my whole life I was connected with these pictures. So it was the first thing that came to mind when I thought about genetic engineering. So what does it mean for us as communicators? We need to be aware of social identities. We need to be aware of that the groups perceive us through their social lens, their values and their emotions. And these things need to be respected. Also these concerns can come from different values than the ones that we are sharing. So we need to be aware of this. And I think the most important point is that we need to go into a dialogue and it's not just informing. And last thing which I found very interesting in the Eurobarometer, which is also called also for students and younger scientists, um, the power of peers. We are the strongest expert in our own friend groups, in our own families. And actually the most prevalent point where we get in contact with science after mass media directly is talking with family and friends. So besides all the high level stuff that we can do as institutions, we also have the ability to work on our own groups where we're actually seen as an expert and not usually running into the problem of, protect, uh, of a value-based defense based on identity. What does it mean in the end? We should think science communication beyond knowledge. There's more to it than just spreading information. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaiser. Any questions from the public? Nobody. Oh, there is a question. <laughs> a saver. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just transfer the same question that I got. Um, what do we need to change? What? Sorry. What do we need to change for the attitude? So, in order to make it happen. That's a good point. And I would maybe keep a bit like I would maybe push it back to after talk of Miss Augustine, because she will, will go more into practical stuff. So she has more experience actually we're talking uh, to, to politicians and so on, where we actually apply this. So I would schedule to this and then if the point is still open, we can discuss. Yeah. So as I see it, we will follow up with the next talk and then you can have questions to both, right? Okay, perfect. Mr. Kaiser, uh, you can take your seat and I will ask to come on stage your colleague, Svenja Angusten from the Cluster of Excellence in Plant Science. So hello, uh, as, uh, as, uh, I'm really, really happy to be here and to be, in, uh, to be invited to be a speaker at this conference. Uh, as, was, well, as was already mentioned, I'm Svenja Augustin from the Cluster of Excellence in Plant Science uh, and I'm also a board member of the Eco Progressive Network in Germany, uh, an organization of early career researchers and farmers mostly. Uh, engaging in science communication surrounding plant breeding and agriculture in Germany. And today I'm going to let you in in a little, sec in a little secret on me, of me. 
I was anti-GMOs. When I first got involved with politics around 15 years ago, I protested education policies and then I quickly became a union member. I, here on the picture you can see me peacefully protesting fascists in my hometown. I advocated for workers' rights, more social justice, anti-fascism and feminism. My political core values were social justice, equity and democracy. Note that I was not really interested in environmental politics and, or even agriculture. And yet I had a very strong opinion on GMOs in agriculture or food. And that was, if you would have asked me 15 years ago, I would have told you that GMOs in agriculture primarily benefit large corporations and ruin small farmers which was already in contrast with two of my core values, social justice and equity, and therefore enough to convince me that GMOs might be a bad idea. And furthermore, my friends, my political peer group, and therefore my trustworthy source of information, told me that there might be some risks involved for the environment and also human health. And therefore it was quite clearly we have to stop GMOs. There's no debate on this. And um, political parties in Germany funct basically function as political peer groups and their, the opinions on genome editing by politicians often are strongly connected with their party memberships and their political values. Currently, the German parliament uh, uh, um, has fractions of six different parties. Five of them are, in my opinion, democratic, and I listed them here. Uh, the top row, you can see the Greens, the Social Democrats, and the Liberals. They form the current German government, and the Socialists and the Conservatives are part of the opposition today. Here I listed them and arranged them according to their official statements regarding novel genomic techniques and GMOs. And as you can see, and, and when, we, when we take a closer look at the political values that each of these parties represents most and how they affect their political opinions on GMOs and novel genomic techniques such as genome editing, we can see that there's this connection between genome editing and party membership. For example, when we look at the liberals, they value innovations and are likely to be early adopters of new technology. They also value entrepreneurship and are strong proponents of GMOs and also now um, in novel genomic techniques mostly. In contrast, the socialists are generally distrusting of company interests and the fact that uh, the belief that uh, novel genomic techniques might increase patents on seeds available on the German market are already, is already sufficient for them to oppose novel genomic techniques and genome editing in plant breeding in Germany. The conservatives, ah, nah. eh. the conservatives uh, slowly changed their opinion over the, past, in, over the course of the past five years in Germany. And I personally feel that uh, narratives surrounding food security and Germany being less dependent on food imports resonated most with them. On top of that, they have a strong connection to conventional farmers as well as they are, they are also quite likely to follow scientific authorities in, in these matters. This leaves us with two more parties of the German government, the Greens and the Social Democrats. The Greens have a strong tradition in being connected with organic farming and they also promote the um, overall narrative of being in harmony with nature. This is central to their argumentation. On top of that, they uh, cite 
potential risks of these new technologies as well as patents and consumer choices and this is, this is their basis for opposing novel genomic techniques in Germany and plant breeding. For the Social Democrats, the largest party in the German government right now, genome editing and GMOs haven't been a priority topic in the past. They have some official resolutions opposing the use of GMOs and novel genomic techniques in agriculture, but, uh, where they mostly cite consumer interests and potentially also sometimes risks, but in general this has not been a priority for them. And a couple of weeks ago, the German party now has officially announced that they have started an open dialogue within their party to come to terms and come to a new position on novel genomic techniques in plant breeding. So when I look at this as an as a early career researcher and science communicator, these two parties are from, are from my perspective the most important, the most relevant right now. Because they could, could be the tipping, could make the tipping point in Germany being either in favor or against novel genomic techniques in agriculture. And what I would like to see personally is for them to change their minds and be in favor of a reform on novel genomic techniques in agriculture. For the scientists among us, I would like to emphasize here that we are asking a lot from our politicians in this context. We are asking a lot because changing your mind from one position to the exact opposite is really difficult and in the case of politicians it requires for them to at least for themselves admit but sometimes even publicly admit that they have been wrong in the past. This is difficult and it is in my opinion up to us scientists and also science communicators to make this difficult decision the easier choice for politicians as opposed to just sticking with an outdated regulation that we have right now. So, well, what, that might, what changed my mind? As you can see, while my lipstick and also my political core values remained the same throughout the past 15 years, my general opinion on novel genomic techniques and GMOs changed quite drastically. And maybe, potentially, an argumentation that worked for me might also work for politicians, right? What works once might, might work twice, never change a running system. But I can tell you, politicians are not biology undergraduates. Um, <laughs> During my biology undergraduate studies, I met a professor who not only convinced me to exchange my field of studies from medical biotechnology to plant sciences, but he also shared many of my political core values, and this built trust. This trust, in combination with my increasing knowledge on genetics, let build the foundation for me to change my mind on novel genomic techniques. In addition, this professor also took hours, and I mean literally hours, over the course of months to discuss each and every single little concern I would have ha that I might have had concerning genom genome editing. This took a long time and finally I was able and allowed to change my mind on novel genomic techniques, genome editing and plant breeding without being in conflict with my political identity and this is important. I was not in conflict with my political values when I decided I changed my mind on novel genomic techniques. So, as I already said, Politicians are not like biology undergraduates. Usually, they don't have months to come to an opinion or for, for a single vote that they have to, make, have to make. 
they typically also don't have a background in biology or genetics. There are exceptions to this, but it is not the majority of politicians who are biologists. And even though, as Christian told you, scientists enjoy quite a bit of trust and are, quite, are seen as a reliable source of information, I am still an outsider. I am not a part of the, I'm usually not a part of their political party and therefore I'm not part of their political peer group and have no badge saying, hey, I share the same values as you do. And certainly politicians do not require my goodwill to pass their degrees. This is quite important. They don't require me to, to um, approve of what they do. But what they do need, in my opinion at least, are information and reliable information to make good policies and also they do need working solutions for societal challenges that are that come together with their, with their general political strategies. It's not feasible to have a coherent strat political strategy and then because someone told you to add genome editing on top of that. It's just not working. So, but first of all, how do we get in contact with these politicians and who are we in this context? We want to talk to them and want to offer, uh, offer science-based information and an open dialogue. And as early career researchers and farmers and also biology students and science communicators in the, area of, in the areas of plant breeding and agriculture, we decided to form the Eco-Progressive Network. This is by now an officially recognized and registered NGO in Germany. And with this NGO, we were able to just plainly text those politicians. We wrote emails to all of those five and actually got invited to some, info, to, to some, uh, to, uh, some conversations. And this started quite a bit of a, of, a, of a productive dialogue. Also, by now, because uh, the media covered some of our activities as an NGO, politicians see us and recognize us as a valid source of information as well. We have the scientific, um, uh, we have support of the scientific community in Germany and by now politicians also reach out to us to participate in either informal meetings or in their political debates uh, on, a uh, on a public podium. The two biggest challenges that I faced during these, in, in these types of science communication are for once the confirmation bias and secondly false balance. Confirmation bias happens when there is a political opinion and members of parties search for some sort of validation of this opinion. And from what, from what I saw so far, the Greens, the Socialists and the Social Democrats all at some, par at some point came to this institute, a seemingly scientific institute which uh, in my opinion, disseminates misinformation. For example, they uh, uh, disseminate a narrative on flexible safety barriers in the genome that we discussed yesterday as well, as well as the so-called specific patterns of gene genetic modification. The issue with these kinds of misinformation is that it takes 10 times longer to explain and reject these kinds of information than it is to just than it takes to just repeat them and take them for granted. Rejecting misinformation takes so much energy and so much time and is rarely successful. But it is necessary because due to confirmation bias, test biotech is viewed as a neutral and valid source of information. The other thing I face is false balance. 
And this is more often more commonly seen in public debates, where organizers of political debates wish to seem sort of impartial or want to represent the whole picture. While researching, they see there's a conflict in opinions, and then they make a panel of different um, panelists and people who should discuss with each other, and the um, parties are 50-50. 50% against and 50% in favor of the use of novel genomic techniques does not represent the scientific consensus on this matter. But to appear impartial, um, scientific minorities get blown out of proportion in this context. These are two very important challenges and particularly for the public uh, discussions, I have to say that in my opinion, they are extremely inefficient when it comes to conveying information because you don't have enough time to address each and every question and these events are really, really polarized and usually the most important take-home message for the audience is there is a complex debate going on and there is more uncertainty now than it was prior to the event. However, it is important to still represent science in these panels. Do not give 100% of the, of, of the public attention to misinformation. That is not a good strategy. But this is not what I want to point out, is that this is not sufficient to really change people's minds. They are really inefficient in conveying information. So what are my best experiences? Small in-person meetings where we can have an open dialogue based on shared values and political goals. And this often, they, here it is really important to have little to no publicity because then politicians are in a, in a situation where they don't, have, no, don't necessarily have to raise their political profile and are able and in a situation to just ask, I didn't understand this, can you please explain? This never happened in a public debate. In private debates, it happens, and I'm really happy to see this. So, one of my best experiences a few weeks ago was uh, from a couple of, from a um, number of young Greens, actually, and based on a conversation on how to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in agriculture, because they all have a background in climate change policies, um, and they discussed how we could reduce fertilizer applications. We discussed how to tweak photosynthesis maybe to increase carbon fixation and also the possibility of perennial crops and the potential. It is really important and crucial to have good examples at the ready when you are talking to non-biologists. Having good examples with a feasible and tangible practical use is really good. And here I really want to highlight one of my favorite resources of lately for good examples because the EU SAGE database not only comprises 600, more than 600 different applications, you can filter by different application and different trade that you would like to see and can see if novel genomic techniques, genome editing could contribute to uh, achieving these plant rates in the field. So, in summary, when I would, and when I were to give some key advice here, first and foremostly, be polite. This is sometimes difficult, especially in these polarized debate, public debates as well as social media, but I can assure you the number of people who changed their minds based on an insult is terribly small. Few people do that and it's seldomly in your favor. Secondly, highlight shared values and what you can do and achieve with these novel genomic techniques. But with all this um, highlighting of shared values, it is very important to stay authentic. And that is why, for example, I don't talk to all parties. 
I don't have a common ground with all parties. And still, I would encourage you to um, talk to all democratic parties and most importantly also other stakeholders. And I would really like to highlight farmers in this context. Farmers are the ones with practical experience and me as a molecular biologist, I had no clue about agricultural practices. Being in conversations with farmers via the Eco Progressive Network was very, very enlightening for me. We also, heard, uh, we also already heard about being realistic. In my opinion, novel genomic techniques are a key tool to improve sustainability in plant breeding and agriculture, but they are not a silver bullet. Just because we use NGTs does not necessarily and automatically lead to more sustainability. Sustainability is a factor that arises also from agricultural practices. It is not an, it's not automatic that you have sustainable sustainability effects due to admission of NGTs. And lastly, and this is super important, argue based on science. Do not spread misinformation. Have good examples at the ready and also have fun. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Augustine, for um, even the great insight into the thinking of the GMO opposing groups. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any questions? Yeah, I can see. Oh, we just have time for one question. I'm really oh, sorry. sorry. So, <laughs> maybe we will have, we will give the chance to. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you. I agree completely with you yet that we need a better dialogue with the politics. Uh, and now, especially to Germany, uh, and you have shown also a picture about uh, relevant people, I would say. And my main question is, do you receive an answer from the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment? We are in contact with some people working there, oh. but we do not uh, receive answers by the heads of the ministry, both the environmental as well as the agricultural ministry. We have tried multiple times. They evade these kinds of uh, offers. Okay, that's also my impression. Mm -hmm. We have also no success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we got really great advice now from <laughs> Svenja. Um, okay, if, if it's a short question. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the persons you showed the picture of is Steffi Lemke. Yeah. What is your plan to change her mind? It seems to me she is the most important image in your presentation. I am not entirely certain if she is the absolute most important person. And in, in my opinion, from, from her previous statements, I would think that it is quite a futile attempt to, to try and uh, convince her of the opposite, because it's so integrated in her political identity. But uh, I think what we can achieve, considering that the growing minority in the green, among the Green Party members of 35 to 40 percent who are in favor of NGTs, um, if we can increase this, this might not help within the next three months, but I do believe that we can change in the opinions uh, of the majority of Green Party members, which in turn might also reflect on political actions by, by heads of the ministries. One last question. Thank you. Hugely interesting presentations from uh, uh, Christian and, and, and yourself. Um, one of the questions which I wanted to ask really to you is talking or thinking back to the generational discussion we had, you know, old versus young. Is it not 
uh, more a matter of political parties being stuck in old uh, thinking schemes. Uh, to use your presentation, mm -hmm. um, we saw anti-GMO, pro-GMO, but the NGT debate is a whole different debate. But they use, do they use the old scheme anti-pro-GMO for approaching the, um, the, uh, the NGT debate? That is one second. Um, how can politicians get convinced of the fact or no? Uh, um, would, it be, would there be a case to make to believe that party members or voters don't change positions because of political parties adapting their positions, if you see what I mean? Uh, do you mean that... Uh, for example, if the Green Party were now to say, okay, we're pro-NGTs and we have actually developed, mm -hmm. we have become wiser, um, what do you think would the impact be uh, towards their electorate? Uh, first of all, they mi uh, parties might be stuck in old thinking. They do repeat the narratives of the old GMO debate uh, because in Germany, NGTs are framed in the GMO debate. They are, men they are seen as GMOs and right now they are also regulated as GMOs. So that is the general framing we are talking about. We try to break this up by comparing this to mutagenesis and this is one of the m major narratives that scientists use but in general the political debate is framed as GMO debate. And secondly, uh, I do believe that the Greens would lose some voters if they were uh, for, for <coughs> GMOs right now. Uh, but I don't think that this would be a long-term effect and I don't really know if this would affect the next vote, actual votes, because they are mostly seen as the climate change party. People vote for them as for, for, to address the climate change mostly. And if the Greens were, were, were able to man, would manage to um, frame their yes to NGTs as a contribution to saving the climate, that would be beneficial for them. So it's down to communication again and again. <laughs> right, thank you very much, Ms. Augustine. Take your seat. And And we are very pleased to have here also the Director of the Food Safety Department of the Ministry of Agriculture of the Czech Republic, Jitka Getzova. So thank you for inviting me, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, I can promise that the debate and discussion with the politicians and Ministry of Agriculture in the area of NGTs and GMOs and innovations, it's not so complicated as in Germany, as was presented in, uh, in the previous speech. So uh, let me introduce you position of the Czech Republic as a presidency country in this area. So I would like to talk about uh, how the agri-food sector is involved in these days with not only uh, uncertainties like COVID, pan COVID pandemic, uh, weather or conflicts and economy shocks and energy crisis, but also I would like to mention how it's, uh, how it's uh, important to talk about the European Green Deal goals and uh, well, this is the other side of, of uh, all the agriculture and all the, all the debate because the, the, there are policy makers who brought the European Green Deal which should have been a huge accelerator of changes towards sustainability and safety. And Green Deal covers also other strategies like farm to fork and also biodiversity strategy and both of them uh, bring huge challenges for farmers and it's necessary to debate also uh, about food, food producers and suppliers in whole Europe, how they will be involved with, uh, with uh, all these topics. While the need for urgent action to protect the climate and is unquestionable, Green Deal was not received clearly positively because it raised many new questions but let me say that uh, I didn't find many answers in, in all these strategies. So uh, 
The search also for answers is complicated because the political and economic situation has changed dramatically since the, the Green Deal was introduced. What seemed costly two or three years ago appears threatening in the context of current situation. So we have targets, these targets are challenging, and we need to look for solutions of these goals and also make them achievable. So time is running out to find answers, and if these targets are to be achieved by 2030, we do not have much time. So how these targets look like? We need to produce safe, nutritious, sustainable food. We also need to assure that uh, food will be affordable. We need to bring neutral and positive environmental impact. We need to understand climate change and adapt to it. We need to increase biodiversity, but and we need to also not to jeopardize competitiveness of European farmers. So when we are talking about all the sustainability, we need to tell that agri-food sustainability starts in the field. So it's necessary also to focus the debate on goals which are, for instance, reduction of use of pesticides. So I would like to focus on this objective of farm to fork and new regulation on the sustainable use of plant protection products, which is uh, under debate now. And it has caused attention and debate among professional agriculture community in the EU. It's reduction of pesticides and how to do it. According to available impact assessment, reaching this target may reduce the competitiveness of European agriculture and seriously threaten EU food security. So farmers have to protect plant health because they need to assure food safety. Plant protection products are generally a significant cost for farmers and it's not in their interest to overuse them. And usually uh, people do not understand it. People think that uh, pesticides is some, some threat and they, they are not thinking about that pesticides could be something like medicine for people. So there has been a long-term reduction of active substances in EU and sufficiently effective and economically affordable alternatives are still not available. So we need to bring the debate on this side and also think about how we should help farmers to reach the goals. And here you can see that Czech Republic is doing quite well. This is a picture how we should uh, increase uh, or sorry, decrease, uh, decrease uh, or should reduce use of chemical pesticides. And in Czech Republic, we should decrease uh, the use by 35%. And in more hazardous pesticides, we should reduce by 51%. But you can see that many uh, European member states are need to reduce their use of pesticides much more. So, as I have mentioned, unfortunately, available impact assessment, which was done by uh, European Commission, predict extensive negative impact on uh, EU agriculture and food industry in sustainability, competitiveness, safety and food security. So, here you can see uh, member states' concerns and now the debate uh, about this uh, proposal is ongoing and we still are not, we, we are still at the beginning. So the ban of use of pesticides in sensitive areas is one of the main concerns uh, of all member states. And for example, in Czech Republic, around 24% of agricultural land is located in sensitive areas. It should probably, it's for you, you can see it's a lot, but for instance in Denmark, it can be 90% of agricultural land. So for them, it will be the debate how they will plant their products. So is it necessary to talk about it? 
So we believe, we believe that finding a solution to the sustainable use of plant protection products is not a national issue. It's uh, only possible through the debate, uh, common EU effort. And Czech Republic is honored that, it's, uh, that this debate started under Czech presidency and we have leadership and also we uh, lead this debate uh, on, on EU level. So time is running quickly and a lot of discussion is still in front of us. So we would like to propose that uh, in general uh, introduction of innovative approaches and techniques is a possible solution to achieve Green Deal objectives. And in the field, pla uh, in the field of plant protection, gene technology uh, has enormous potential. Unfortunately, in this area where Europe has already fallen behind and missed the train. To be honest, we really missed the train. We need to make sure that we do not make the same mistake again in Europe with new genomic techniques. I would like to also mention that during our previous presidency, uh, one of our priorities was GMO. And we have published a white book focusing on GM crops. And as my colleague asked the, the question to Mrs. Shoydrava, now we continue with the promoting new breeding techniques and we opened this debate during the informal meeting of Agri Council in the middle of September this year. And this topic was really appreciated by ministers of agriculture. So what we see as a potential contribution of new genomic techniques, uh, NGT can contribute to minimize the use of pesticides. They can also cope with climate change, strengthen the food and feed security in the European Union, minimize agriculture inputs and reduces the carbon footprint. They also can bring higher yields, lower costs, better quality and nutrient rich crops. And I believe they can boost the competitiveness of European agriculture and food production. And as a presidency country, we welcome the policy initiative to adapt EU legislation, and we really appreciate it. And uh, we are convinced that EU cannot afford to miss this opportunity again. So finally, I would like to thank the Czech Academy of Science for organizing this event. And I also would like to invite you uh, to the international conference, which will be organized by the Ministry of Agriculture. So I hope we see you in November in Prague Congress Center again. And I look forward to continue the debate on sustainable agriculture in Europe. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Getsova. Does anybody have questions? Or one question? Two questions. That was clear enough. Well, I have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, it will be really fast because you talked a lot about the reducing the pesti use of pesticide. Well, the question also is, are the Czech farmers and producers ready for implementation of new genetic methods? They are. They, yeah, are. they are. It's, n it's not banned in Czech Republic and uh, it's only on decision of the farmers if they would like to plant. They also can plant GMOs now, but uh, since I guess 2018 there is no farmer who is planting uh, GM crops. But uh, the reason is probably economic because they need to label it, they need to store it uh, separately. So it's, it's a question of uh, economical costs. So now they are, they are ready, they would like to apply, uh, apply NGTs and also they uh, are prepared to use it in practice. I would like to thank you to precise the date of conference, to precise the position in council. Thank you very much. Just, yes, uh, our agricultures, you are absolutely right. But uh, uh, I meet the ordinary people in the meetings, in the regions. There is not so clear. Uh, we, we should really to disseminate the new uh, findings, the new informations 
I think uh, there are some <laughs> colleagues, uh, some uh, researchers, and Professor Delezel participated in the debate in my region, and uh, he saw that the, the questions uh, raised. So, yes, uh, agriculture, they, are, they, they know what, what is the... Uh, what is the advantage, but the ordinary people, we should maybe mm, mm, disseminate the, the information more. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. The communication is, uh, is necessary and we are trying to communicate all these topics uh, very openly and very transparently. So we are organizing uh, a lot of, uh, lot of events, not only for, for scientists and politicians, but only for for general public, and also we are trying to, to give uh, the, all the information on our website of an information center of food safety and websites of the Ministry of Agriculture, and we are also uh, publishing uh, several brochures and, and uh, publications about this topic. So, so it's every, everything is uh, transparently on our website, and we are trying to communicate with public very openly because not only benefits, but it brings only uh, also risks, and it's necessary to say it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next speaker came here from France, and I'm really sorry because my speaking ability of French is non-existent. So if I mispronounce something, I'm really sorry. But please welcome on stage Mr. Georges Fresinet from the Association Française de Biotechnologie Végétale. Thank you. I first uh, would like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to uh, present the uh, AFBV and WGG regulatory proposal to enable the uh, genome editing plant in Europe. Uh, the presentation you, you heard yesterday afternoon and this morning have shown you the potential and the benefit of genome editing for food safety and for crop improvement, and I will not come back on that. The result presented confirm the urgent need, the uh, term urgent has been used several times, for breeders to have full access to this tool to develop quickly new innovative varieties capable to sustain the, cli the climate change we are facing. This tool, as the overused by the breeder, are critical to help achieve also the farm to fork strategy. If the current GMO legislation is unchanged, it is very likely that edited plant will not be commercialized in Europe, as this is the case for other GM plant. So, in front of this situation, the WGG and the AFBV decided to make a detailed proposal for three main reasons. The developer need to have, whether it is a researcher for his research or a breeder to go to commercial, he needs to have a clear vision of a legislation in place to allow such edited plant uh, on the market. Several countries, you heard that uh, this morning in the US, in uh, uh, South America, have already put in place a, such a legislation and the first edited plant are on the market in some of these countries. Due to the time limit, I will not give you information, additional information on our two uh, organizations. So you have the WGG uh, in, uh, in Germany and the uh, AFBV in, uh, in France, and you can find additional information on our website. So, face with the need for urgent action, we are proposing to adapt the current legislation by extending the exclusion mechanisms, which is already in place in the current legislation. You know that in Europe, we had a very broad definition of GMO, so that means almost everything is in GMO. And then from that, we set up several exclusions. So we say, can we use the same mechanisms for uh, the uh, gene editing. The problem with gene editing is that the technology is so powerful 
that you can do a lot of things and you can go for a small change up to the insertion of one or several genes. So it means that you cannot uh, uh, exclude from the legislation the technology of genome editing as such. So with that in mind, we uh, decided to propose to establish different category of edited plant on, based on their characteristic of the edited plant and not on the technique used. And considering the current situation knowledge we are, we have today, we are proposing as a first step to establish four categories of edited plant. And these categories have been established compared to what the breeder can breed by conventional technique. And I will describe these four, uh, four categories. So the first one corresponds to plants which have been edited to reproduce a functionality associated with a known allele present in its gene pool. So in fact, if you go to the conventional breeding, it corresponds to crossing a wild type with a cultivated plant and introduce the trait you need from the wild type. And the example below gives you the, uh, uh, the example of rice tolerant to salt. And this has been done by editing uh, one of the genes which is involved in uh, salt tolerance. And it was known and mutant were available. The second category uh, contains the plant edited to reproduce a functionality present in a plant species outside the plant genome. So it's an extension of category one, where we are taking information from a plant which cannot be crossed sexually, but the trait is present in this plant, and we uh, make an addition in the targeted plant to have the same a type of trait. And the example below, it's something which is uh, well known and I think which has been said already here. It's the addition of the MLO gene based on the knowledge that those genes have uh, to confer uh, mildew resistance from uh, in barley. So with that in mind, the, uh, you make the same addition to have the same effect in wheat. The third category, we have plant edited to reproduce a new functionality of which the uh, sequence modification are of the same type as was obtained uh, by uh, a spontaneous or induced mutation. And if you look at what is such addition in the conventional system, so it's a plant which has a new allele which has been obtained after induced or spontaneous mutation. And then you select the plant and you breed that into your cultivated variety. So you do exactly the same, except that on, on, uh, instead of having a, a, a mutation by a chemical, you do an addition. And you can see on the, on one example, uh, this is the Sicilian Rouge I gab, uh, Gaba tomato, which is on sale in uh, Japan. Uh, and this plant has been produced uh, by addition uh, using the information we have on the Gaba biosynthesis. And in fact, they uh, remove. in the GABA. The last category, it's a plant in which you introduce a complete gene or several genes, either randomly or at a chosen locus as an extra copy of, of a swap. And in fact, if you look in what is known today, uh, we know that in a genome, you may have one or several copies of the same gene or a similar gene. And that, when you compare the genome of, uh, the genome of different plants from the same species, you may find a plant which has a gene which is not present in another plant. So in fact, the breeder can uh, cross this plant, but you can also insert the corresponding gene into the plant. And the example I uh, took is, uh, oops, sorry. it's the uh, nitrogen efficiency genic barley. So what the people did is they introduced an, an extra copy of a gene 
And with that, the nitrogen efficiency is, uh, is better. We could have done that by breeding, but you know, by breeding, you have to remove after that what do you don't want. So that's the four uh, category. And what we are proposing is that these four category of feeded plant should be excluded from the scope of the directive. You realize that one edited plant can have several edited or inserted genes, and some people talked uh, yesterday, I think, on gene pyramiding, so that's one uh, of the possibility. And then, since we establish category, as scientific knowledge increases, then we can add a new category when we are confident with what you can make. But with that in mind, we said it's to make confident uh, the user confident of what we have produced, we decided that it was probably good to have a confirmation procedure. So, in fact, what we think is that the notifier should obtain the, the confirmation that the plant edited he has made corresponds to one of the four categories as described. So, when do you do that? So the request, you make it whenever you want to get out of the GMO regulation. So you can do that at the research stage, you can do that at a later stage when you go to the field, or you can do that just before commercialization. And in any case, you have to do that before marketing. You cannot go to market. Where to apply? So to, you apply to a competent authority of a member state, which will consult with VFSA for the category uh, uh, validation. And the EFSA should give you an answer yes or no. If yes, it is automatically excluded from GMO regulation. How the information requirement will depend on the category. You will probably have to supply more information for a plan from category four, uh, three than for a plan for category one. But the process should be concluded in the, uh, very rapidly and 90 days is probably for us a good uh, time. The validity of this, of this uh, process, so the exclusion determination would be valid in all member states and for all the progeny coming from the edited plant. Do you know that from uh, one edited plant you can make a lot of variety? So if you have the exclusion confirmation for one edited plant, then you can go for uh, uh, all the variety. We think that a public register can uh, be established containing this excluded edited plant if needed for transparency. Once you have confirmation of the exclusion is obtained, so you are out of the GMO le uh, legislation, that does not mean so you don't have any control. Any variety produced using the edited plant will be subject to the directive uh, uh, 2002 which set up the rule for the registration of variety of seed of the agricultural and vegetable species respectively and their marketing within the union and to the member state plant variety regulation applicable to available uh, crop species in the same manner as any current variety obtained through traditional breeding technique. The labeling and traceability regulation applicable to conventional variety would also apply to excluded edited plant variety registration. There is no need because you are excluded from the GMO legislation to have a specific labeling and traceability. And finally, the information on the edit as well as the confirmation of the plant exclusion will be provided to the authority in charge of applying seed and plant variety registration. So that's the uh, process, and uh, uh, with the WGG, uh, we work on the proposal and uh, made a specific amendment to the directive. So we have a text which gives you the amendment which can be used, and this is summarized on the next uh, slide. So in this amendment, you have a description of the genome editing and C genesis. We put two, uh, point, two additional points in the Annex 1A Part two, uh, 1 of the current directive. 
We have a description of four categories of genome edited plants to be excluded from the scope of the directive, and this is done through a new 1X, 1C. The Article 4 of the amendment is uh, the notification procedure to member state competent authority with the information requirement. And finally, we said that, uh, you, you remember that I said that you, we can add the uh, category to this uh, system. So we propose a revision every five years if justified by the technical progress and advance in scientific knowledge. So uh, this is applicable to plant, edited plant, but you can think that you can apply that also for other issues in the current uh, GMO legislation. Today there is no real system for revision. And finally, we think that it is a good opportunity to clarify the status of a null segregant. So the null segregant, we do that through uh, part three to the annex A. And it is important because most of the time when you do gene editing, you go through a transgenic step. And then you remove your transgen, so, so your transgene, so you have a null segregant. So it's very important for us that this is uh, clarified. So I am done with the uh, presentation. If you want more information, you can ask uh, uh, you in the room. We have uh, Philippe Dumont for VIFBV and uh, Klaus Jani from VWGG are present. And uh, the proposal, including the explication and the amendment, is on our website, whether the FBV website and the uh, WGG website. And it's in French, English, and German. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Any questions from the public? Maybe, uh, can I ask just for the clarification, the proposal was from the two other institutions that you mentioned in the beginning, to whom? To the European Commission, ex no, directly? The, uh, yeah, we sent that to the Commission, and we sent that because you have a German and a French organization, so we sent that to different ministries in France and in, France, in uh, Germany. And the first uh, draft of the proposal was sent in 2020. And we did an update after the uh, uh, early this year. All right, thank you. Right, thank you very much. You can take your seat. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I can see many of you standing and leaving. I believe we are all a little bit tired, but we still have a few speakers to come up. So I suggest right now, breathe in, breathe out, stretch a little bit, so you can reset for the last speakers. Is it okay for you just take a minute in here? Ah, you're fine. Okay, let me welcome the next speaker. It's Andrzej Novak, a Chief Narrative Scientist at Reimagine Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to, uh, for inviting me to this very important conference. And here I'll uh, represent our research on narratives on agricultural innovation done at Reimagine Europe. And basically this is really the work of the task force on sustainable agriculture innovation of Reimagine Europe. And you can, if you're interested, you can read this in a full report that's available online. So let me start from a story that's very often used in conflict negotiations. There were two, star, there were two sisters that wanted to divide an orange. And so what would be the just way to divide a, or the right way to divide an orange? And I think sisters did what seems to be the common sense and, and the right approach. They just divided the orange in half. If they have talked, they would have discovered that really one of them wanted the, wanted the inside of the orange for the juice, the other one wanted the peel to make a cake. So actually, if we listen to really what people are, what are the true objectives and needs, we can, some, we can usually find better solutions. So really, Europe needs more sustainable food systems to cope with dramatic changes in our natural environment. 
economic instability, rapid societal transformation. And the issue is complex, involving many dimensions and multiple objectives, like feeding a, a growing global population, ensuring food safety, mitigating climate change and environmental degradation, guaranteeing the development of rural areas, promoting economic growth, and equalizing the chances of different farming models. We have heard about this a lot in this, in this uh, meeting, so I'm not saying much new. I'm just kind of repeating the arguments that we have uh, that we heard. There are, uh, there are many challenges. Uh, there are serious problems concerning food systems in Europe and the world, such as climate change, for example, recent droughts, the need to mitigate climate change, crisis of global f uh, supply chains, in large part due to the war in Ukraine, uh, dramatically increasing prices of food, food security and resilience issues in the face of uncertainty, crisis of rural, ar rural areas, uncertainty about how to implement the far to fork strategy. And Europe needs solutions that would be effective and that can bring Europeans together. It means it can be supported by the stakeholders, policymakers, and the public, and we have heard a lot about it during this meeting. The current debate is torn between opposite positions in a binary choice, pro-innovation versus precaution and traditional oriented uh, approach. So the objective is to address all these challenges and to bring Europeans together in support of these solutions. And really we need a new ecosystem of narratives for the debate on these topics. And that recognizes the multidimensionality of the issues, the complexity and intensity of the corresponding public discourse, and involves all the stakeholders, for example, farmers, and we have just heard this before. And by the way, I have, I, you know, what I'm going to say would be very congruent in, 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 uh, in, in conclusions with what we have heard in the, in the, you know, in the first part uh, before in the session. So why narratives? Really, narratives are users' manual for reality. And narrative analysis allows us to understand the true values underlying conflicting positions on issues. And this paves the way for solutions which maximize the gains of all the stakeholders. Here comes the story of the orange, dividing the orange. And existing narratives are highly polarized. And many, however, uh, and we have found that existing polarized also narratives are highly polarized. Many basic values and beliefs are shared by different sides of the debate. And the common values, and again, right, this is <laughs> one of the congruent, congruent uh, uh, conclusions, can be, uh, can be the starting point for, the, for new narratives that are less polarized, are capable of dialogue, and can lead to a nuanced solutions. So what is our methodology? We've started from, from a massive automatic uh, search for different, sto different stories on, uh, on uh, new technologies in, in agriculture. And basically, both, we looked for both traditional media, we looked some, you know, automatic searches of over 300,000 European uh, articles in Europe, English language uh, articles in European press. We also looked at, at different social media sites. And then, uh, but we used, uh, uh, we use some algorithms to find the main topics and to come through this you know, enormous uh, n number of, of different sources. But, but really the, most, the main of uh, the source, the heart of our analysis was, was human analysis. We just retrieved the most uh, representative, uh, representative articles. But I should say that we also had, have or, or have information on interactivity of all this, uh, of all this uh, so we know how many people commented on them, liked them, shared them. So we were able to look most at the papers that had most, uh, most, most impact. And then we actually read the most uh, representative papers and, and, and the most uh, pop pop popular. And then our final is communication recommendation. Again, you know, very, very similar to what you had before. So we have found two main narratives with many different variants. And for, uh, for uh, precaution focus and for innovation focus. The first precaution focused uh, narrative is what can be called unpredicted consequences. Really, the essence of this is that really um, that scientists do not really understand, uh, understand uh, 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 and cannot control nature. Therefore, the danger. Seen by, by, by 
it by scientists. Another one is, so this is really a danger of something that might happen. Another one is uh, we're violating the rules of nature. The idea is that we are tying, the, we, uh, science may be tying around with natural boundaries uh, separating different species, which may, which may create different forms of mon monstrosity. Such as, for example, I mean, you know, as being illustrated by the pictures of frog apples and you know, <laughs> other similar, other sim similar pictures. Here, here, the difference with the first narrative is that this is basically here, here, uh, uh, here, uh, uh, innovation just creates creates things. Not that they're dangerous, but they're just bad by themselves. I'm sorry. Could you speak more okay, in the sure. microphone? Thank you. Uh, the third one, and, and I'll elaborate on this one, is, is the greed uh, uh, destroys the traditional way of life. So here's the idea that uh, that new uh, that new technologies destroy the the uh, traditional uh, life of farmers. They uh, they limit the freedom of choice by by elevating or or, trans, or elevating food production in the industrial sec sector. The fourth one is we have heard this promises before, which is really, I mean, the new techniques are not really so new. There are variants of what we have, what we have known, what we have discussed, the old, old arguments apply, whatever applied to GMO still, uh, still applies to gene, to, to gene editing. And all, we also have the promises that we are hearing before with uh, gene editing techniques we have here, heard with, with GMO. Uh, the innovation focus narratives are, first of all, is genome editing is progress. So uh, the general narrative is that, it, is that each uh, technological invention is another chapter in the, in the progress of, uh, of, uh, in, of humanity from uh, the hardship of, of uh, f and, uh, uh, elevating us from the hard, hardship of nature or, 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 or natural situations. Then uh, another one is, is we, we, uh, we needed to face a crisis. So we live in a, in a times of unprecedented crisis. We need, we need new te technologies to be able to face the crisis. The third one is suspicions have been addressed and tested. Uh, it, it, uh, these narratives, uh, it is assumed that uh, the doubt is a natural part of an uh, innovation. And we, use, we need to use evidence and science-based methods to address, to check those doubts. And according to this criteria, the, the uh, suspicions have already been addressed. Then we have more precise technologies than ever, but really we're doing nothing new. So the idea is that, well, as, and I think this was, Dirk was very clearly uh, specified this narrative, it means that, well, I mean, you know, that uh, our food production always depended on breeding, on improving our, 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 our plants, and this is, today we have just uh, techniques that are faster and more precise, but this is really nothing new uh, in comparison to what we have done before. I'll just may, maybe uh, concentrate as an example of two narratives in more detail. So, for example, greed uh, destroys tr the traditional way of life. This is precaution-focused fo narratives. And now the of the narrative is, for thousands and thousands of years, traditional forms of agriculture have produced food and fed growing populations. Traditional farming methods evolved in harmony and dialogue with nature, also providing a harmonious way of life. Until one day, big business introduced modern industrial standards into agriculture, destroying traditional farming communities, stealing their freedom, and creating a dense network of financial dependency that replaced traditional social networks of trust. You can see here the images, right? I mean, <laughs> right, we have seen them. Very similar Im images today before, right, that, are, that go along, that illustrate this, this, this narrative. Uh, the narrative we face to, uh, we need to face a, a, a crisis, it is innovation focused narrative. The outline of the narrative we face an unprecedented crisis, this is the moment of decision and new technologies are a crucial weapon or, not, or tool to deal with this crisis. You can see again, I mean, there's a number of, of images representative, you know, or for, this, uh, for this narrative. So what we have discovered, really, you know, uh, doing research on these narratives, 
that really, uh, that also the narratives on different sides of the debates are very polarized, they share many common values and goals. Okay? So narratives, in a way, they unite and divide. The, the narratives, the narratives, you know, have uh, in, on, on the surface, they are really, you know, they're, they're showing a you know, lot of, I would say, uh, polarized views. However, if you look at the, at the values, uh, the both sides share many values. Our old narratives are anchored in the past and are outdated with respect to the facts and new developments in technologies. And usually the main stakeholders, farmer and customers, are left out of the debate. There is a potential for new narratives that can shape the debate that resemble common problem solving rather than position defending debate. And again, this is, <laughs> I think, common with the previous uh, presentation. Uh, where all the sides can find valuable ideas and solutions in the arguments of the others that addresses the main problems and which are based on the common values. Many common values that we have found are actually based on the, on the, on the prime values of solidarity, nature and choice. But for example, importance of great deal in farm to fork strategy, feeding people, food sovereignty, local food, environment, biodiversity, freedom, decentralization, well-being of people, especially farmers, equal chances for small and medium enterprises, equality of chances of small farms and industry. Many shared perception, the need for diverse solutions and systemic approach. The climate change, environmental degradation, decay of villages and family farms need to enhance small and medium enterprises. And often positions on issues are motivated by non-obvious concerns. And again here, I think, <laughs> I've been really amazed to listen to your presentation. And I mean the need to protect small rural heritage, to protect rural cultural heritage, village social life and traditional small farms against big interest, industrial farming is one of the motives of the opposition to, to, to gen editing. So that it doesn't actually have to do anything. So, so at least part of these arguments do, are not really linked to, to the technology itself, but rather to the social connotations of the technology. Uh, we are, and the, the idea of, of our approach is to basically that we can really combine different approaches. So we are not trying to define the single best solution. Consumers as, as well as farmers have different needs, values, objectives and resources. The idea of diversity. Situation is different in different places. We recognize that a mixture of different approaches is needed to solve the problems. For example, both the organic and innovation oriented farms, both small family owned and industrial farming. So how to make the different approaches successful? How can a combination of different approaches shape European food systems of the future. And the idea is that, that really we can talk, instead of trying to find out which position is the right, we can think about assembling a toolbox. So diverse stakeholders will need to work together to build a wide portfolio of solutions that would match the complexity of problems. We need an inclusive approach that considers the arguments of policymakers and scientists, but also gives a fair platform to farmers and consumers. The metaphor of the assembly of a toolbox. What are the effective tools we should have in the toolbox of European food systems? How can the tools be combined? Where, can we, where do we go from here? I mean, there is, a, there is the need for dialogue and a nuanced approach. We need to move from positions to values and solutions. Right, again, very much <laughs> in line with, with, your, with your presentation and mixing different solutions rather than looking for one silver bullet approach. So rather than trying to argue, you know, or to, or to define what is the single best strategy that we can use, look at rather at what strategies we should have, in, uh, what tools we should have in our, in our toolbox to address the, to address the very com complex situations we are, we are facing. Uh, the systemic this is, uh, so, again, uh, uh, what I think this, uh, uh, so for example, the systemic ap approach, which by the way, is also part, uh, as I understand, part of the, or, of the organic perspective, is that, is that if we understand agriculture as a system, 
we can, we can deal with problems more effectively. So for example, what is a waste in one sector can be a resource or a product in an, in, in a, for another sector, right? So then now, now I mean development of, of rural areas. So we want you know the farmers to have you know the ways to the ways you know to be able to 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 uh, to, to have a, to have a good a, a good life. And we should go beyond an oversimplified uh, dichotomy of nature and technology. So we need to avoid false alignments and assumptions. For example, that innovation equalizes, equalizes industrial farming. We need, you know, different types of farming, right? And, and, and new, new techniques can be useful in, and helpful in different approaches. So, so, the, so what, is, what is the narrative methodology? First of all, listen carefully to the various voices in the ongoing di dispute, because there is a lot to be heard, um, uh, you know, under, uh, under the surface. Extract common values and goals often disguised in very different metaphors and images. Look for policy solutions that would incorporate these values and build solutions based on the real needs and concerns instead of defending positions. They need and respect toward each other's side of the debate. Again, <laughs> again another commonality that all sides really are motivated by the concerns for the common good. And everyone has, some, has something to offer. The challenge is how to combine it into a toolbox of, com of compatible solutions. Involve the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, but, but, but you know, uh, farmers, for farmers, consumers, and basically, uh, all the uh, uh, all the stakeholders, and really here there, it gives an interesting perspective on on the role of European institutions that could adopt the role of an honest broker that openly presents various possibilities and facilitates the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Novak. I really enjoyed the fact that your presentation and the presentation of, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my names, um, really linked oh, together. Yeah, Christian and Svenja. Yeah. I just remember the first names, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so does anybody have a follow-up question for Mr. Novak? No, thank you really yeah, much. There is a question. Oh, there is a question, sorry. Thank you uh, for your nice presentation. I see we have a lot in common. Uh, what I would like to know this uh, algorithm-based um, approach that you presented in the in the in the beginning. Um, could you please explain in a little bit more detail how this works, and maybe could you also uh, look at how the shares of scientific pub publications are then, uh, for example. Test Biotech study, uh, publishes a study, uh, study, um, and uh, I would be interested to know if you could trace how much attention this gets in comparison to another valid study with this tool. Yes. Um, uh, well, in principle, uh, we have we have uh, our data for the readership, and we call it interactivity of different articles. Uh, refers to their uh, to the amount of talk on this on social media. So basically, I, you know, I don't think that this is necessarily valid. You know, that citation index citation probably a best better measure to assess the uh, citation index to uh, to assess the validity or or let's say the, or the, the impact of scientific papers. Uh, what we did, we have we have uh, we have. Uh, Collected from uh, from uh, the late 2017 till till present, basically we we selected uh, the main European uh, magazines and journals, you know, in English language for technical reasons because it was easier. It's not perfect, but you know, easier solution. And so right now we have we have by, by now we have over 300,000 articles. For every article we have. How much this article was discussed uh, was discussed on was kind of liked on social media, how many times it was commented, and how many times it was searched. 
and this gives us kind of combined interactivity index that and what we find is by the way that most of the publications have negligible impact a very small very small number of, of really impactful publications you can really you know uh, limit your attention mainly to those now what we can do we can what we do we there, there's this uh, there is the uh, there are techniques for for automatic topic discovery so based on the probability of co-occurrence of different words you can i mean the machine algorithms tells you divides you this uh, this base uh, uh, on topics it tells you it tells you know so which articles are you know form similar groups in the use of in, in the use of terms and then it's up to human so you guess you, you get so we get for every group uh, you know the list of the papers and the original papers we have the database of all the original papers and then it is up to human and also the this machine algorithms identified the most representative uh, papers for each for each topic so then, I mean, it is enough for us to, to read, you know, much smaller number of papers, which we know are typical, and we also use also the most, uh, the most popular interactive ones, okay? And then what we do, we, we, we do, you know, some slightly different methods, you know, because this method is for longer text to analyze, uh, to analyze, uh, uh, to analyze posts and, you know, tweets. Then what we do, we also what we used because, and then excuse me, and then what we what we did really, uh, you know, uh, with that human, but was mainly Martin Apiukowski, my you know, my collaborator, my you know, co uh, collaborator from uh, from this work and the main author of the report. He just read these papers, and he would kind of verbally describe, you know, what is the topic and basically what's the basic, what is the basic narrative. Then what, then what we did, we, we conducted workshops with stakeholders, with experts and so on, where we, where we tested, you know, the proposed narratives, you know, in interacting by presenting, you know, and, and discussing them, and we're also able to include more information. So this is basically our, so this is basically our method. Thank you. The database that you mentioned, is it available somewhere, or at least partial results from what you um, discovered? I think I think that uh, this, this data we have this we have this this database. Uh, we I'd have to check you know about its availability because there may be uh, you know some. Uh, I would say that I, I'm not sure you know how because this is also this by the way this database is not specific to uh, to genomic techniques. It's basically, the database of all the papers from which we have just picked up you know uh, themes you know on on uh, on. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, but I can check it and no, it was just more about a, it could be an interesting feedback for some. Yeah. So that was just the right. question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for your interesting and important insight in the importance of narratives. Thank you very much, thank Mr. You Novak. Very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our conference is about to end. We have one last speaker, and I believe that we will all carry back home some interesting ideas, maybe even tasks. So let me now invite on stage Tom van den Candelere, a member of the European Parliament from Belgium. Dear Madam President of the Czech Academy of Sciences, dear colleagues, distinguished professors, dear participants, it is really an honor for me to close these 24 hours of deep dives deep dive in new genomic techniques here in Prague. And actually, it is not a coincidence that we are here in Prague. It is not a coincidence that we find ourselves together here in the Czech Republic. Because the motto of the Czech Republic is truth alone triumph. Now, thank you for the very enriching debates these last two days and for the brainstorm that is yet to take place this afternoon. And thank you to the Czech Academy of sciences for the excellent organization and especially also for the great atmosphere because a, a good conference has to have a great atmosphere as well. I think we exchanged on new genomic techniques from the most different angles, from Norman Borlo to Ursula von der Leyen or from comparing gene editing to the GPS in your car to the start of a new green revolution. I, and I'm sure I can speak for all my colleagues, we have understood your call towards us lawmakers. And I, for one, can clearly see how new genomic techniques can contribute to the solutions we need for our future. And that future, our future, hinges on what is happening today.
And let there be no doubt about it, ladies and gentlemen, food security is in the very middle of what is happening today. Because food production all over the world is facing massive disruption. And I summarize here three, three key challenges which I picked up during our debates. First, obviously, the cruel war of aggression of Russia in Ukraine and the consequences on yields, on logistics, on the availability of fertilizers and so on are very visible for all of us. And I heard Mr. Dolegel saying yesterday that 1% to 2% of the global energy production is exclusively due to the production of nitrogen fertilizers. Well, reducing the need for these fertilizers should therefore no longer be a taboo. Second challenge, our demography. It is clearly working against us. We're about to have to feed 10 billion mouths on this planet that will be asking for a certain degree of quality food. And while our population grows and our farmlands get smaller, it is clear what urgently needs to change. We will have to produce more food with less farmers, less space and less impact on our planet. Third, and maybe the most important challenge, we have the consequences of climate change. And by far that is not the surprise of the day here, especially in a room full of scientists. But we are now really starting to feel what it means. We have recorded the seven hottest years in Europe in a row since 2015. And as it was already said yesterday, the European Drought Observatory has concluded that almost half of Europe's territory suffers from drought warnings. Traditionally abundant crops like grain, maize and rice are yielding up to 20% less in the last years. And these are the facts. We can no longer disregard them or ignore them. More than just being worried about it, I think we need to act. And besides reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which is exactly what we're trying to do through the Green Deal and through the Fit for 55 legislation, we have to adapt our food production to climate change. And with these three challenges in mind, we have to dare to look ahead. This means we shall dare to look at the opportunities that new genomic techniques can offer. Over the past 24 hours, I've heard very sensible people give all kinds of examples of how NGTs can make a difference to each of the challenges that I just outlined. I won't repeat them all, don't worry, we're too close to lunch now. But I do remember the clear call for a new generation of agricultural crops which are an answer to these challenges. As Dr. Dima of EU Sage yesterday rightly pointed out, the EU legislation is badly lagging behind. But at the research level, there is a lot of potential that needs and that deserves to be activated. But I've also heard politicians that are willing to take up the gauntlet, such as Herbert Dorfman or Michaela Seudrov, my good colleagues, who together with me are willing to take the facts, the research and the spot on examples back to the table in Brussels and convince fellow policymakers of their importance, or at least try to convince them. And I believe this is more important than ever in the face of our changed political reality, because you need to be aware about this. First of all, there is the European Commission who has an extremely ambitious agenda. 50% less use of pesticides, 50% reduction of nutrient losses, 25% of organic agriculture, 20% less fertilizers, and all of that by 2030. To the like of some and to the dislike of others, ambition is good, but it cannot stand the way of what is realistic. But that being said, the mentality shift towards greening our planet is there to stay. And I'm running my second term in the European Parliament, and the change of focus you can see is undeniable. While there was the Juncker Commission that was focusing on jobs, on investment, on growth, in the aftermath of the financial crisis 2008, the von der Leyen Commission is greener than ever with the Green Deal as its absolute flagship project. Big change. Second big change, the majorities in the European Parliament. While in my previous term, the centre-right, centre-left was basically the default option for all kinds of legislation to get through, today this is no longer the case. There's always a third party that has to be on board to be able to build a majority. And there is an alternative majority possible, a much more progressive majority towards the left, including the Green Party. And we talked about the importance of the Green Party this morning. At the same time, what I feel is that there is a clear momentum that we should seize, especially with the European Commission. 
the preparatory work done by the JRC for the European Commission proposal on NGTs, which I expect in the first half of 2023, is very clear. It concludes, and it was already said, that products obtained from NGTs have the potential to contribute to Green Deal objectives and especially to the farm-to-fork and biodiversity strategies. So that focus on relying those objectives should remain the focus and the leading principle of the European Commission. If the European Commission takes that principle to heart, that NGTs can help, to, help towards realizing the Green Deal ambitions, then there is no alternative but to have a robust and favorable proposal on NGTs. And that is also, by the way, my conclusion. We have no other choice but to give this technology a chance if we want to be taken seriously and credibly about how we think about sustainability in the future. If we want to be able to feed 10 billion mouths in the future, if we want to be able to cope with extreme weather conditions, and if we want to do all of that during times of war, if we don't do this, we would be hypercritical and allow the debate to run its course on the basis of emotion instead of reason. Let's be honest, that has rarely resulted in good things in politics. Now, the messages towards us policymakers yesterday and today were, were very clear. I have noted four messages down that are absolutely clear. First, although the EU legislative framework tells different, CRISPR-Cas and other NGTs are totally different from, NG, from GMOs. The, the DCJ ruling of 2018, putting gene editing and GMOs on, on an equal footing, was based on legal grounds, not on scientific grounds. It is now our task to make legislation in the first place that is fit for purpose and science-based. Second takeaway, the most appropriate way to deal with crops derived from NGTs is to treat a part of gene-edited crops as conventional crops and to regulate plants with the same changes in the same way, although they have been obtained with a different technology. Third takeaway, we cannot distinguish the change or varieties when comparing plants derived from conventional breeding or plants derived from gene editing. Therefore, we should, as lawmakers, be very cautious with labeling requirements parallel to the current GMO legislation, especially because politicians love labeling policies. Fourth and last takeaway, I agree with the message of Mr. Blaha yesterday that we, the European Parliament, should build up the pressure towards the European Commission to act and to act soon to avoid getting too, clo too close to elections and political turmoil. So the facts are clear, and in a city like Prague, in a country like the Czech Republic, where truth must prevail, as I said, it's very clear. The NGT methods are precise, they are controlled, they are faster, and this is the message me and my colleagues will take home to Brussels and repeat it there, loud and clear. I don't think we should proclaim that NGTs are the solution to all challenges that we were discussing, but we should at least give breeders and farmers this very useful extra tool in their toolbox. They deserve it, and rather sooner than later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your straightforward words and also a perfect summary of this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the conference, but I believe it could be a beginning of something new in your organization, in your institution. So please now accept our invitation for lunch that will be served upstairs as yesterday. For those who were not here yesterday, please follow the signs or your colleagues. And remember after the lunch at 14.30 or 2.30 p.m., uh, there you are welcome to meet here again for an ad hoc meeting on the proposal of the legis legislation for plants produced by the new genomic techniques as was announced yesterday two times i believe if you have more questions please ask on adima just over there just so you know the presentations uh, and the whole conference was recorded and it is the recording of the stream is available at the web of the conference as well as photos that have been taken here throughout the two days. So feel free to use it. You will find it on the website of the conference.
And that is really everything I wanted to say. So ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure to have you here in Prague. I hope you had a good time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful day and a safe journey back home. Thank you.